Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Badger Banter. And we're actually getting like a, a sink. It's going. happening, it's happening. <laughs> uh, I mean for the first few it was rough. Yeah. <laughs> we we look back on them. Rough and is we, an understatement. <laughs> yeah. So as we we're recording we're pre-recording this as we always do. We're kind of four to five episodes ahead. Um yeah. And so we're recording this on the 4th of November 2017, and it's been a doozy of a couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, we've been <laughs> yeah. very busy, Badgers, which is, to any of our patrons watching this and events of everybody else, we're sorry that it's been a little lackluster on the old content front for a bit, but you know you'll be repaid <coughs> with volumes of it. In fact, just today, there will be a whole bunch of stuff going out, so. Yeah, in the past, you've watched the first one and some other cool exclusive things. Yeah. So, as per usual, we're going to start off with a couple of quick shout-outs. And for once, I think this is, we, we, it'll inadvertently happen, but it doesn't contain Nick Vince. No, it does, but <laughs> it's just the Nick Vince shout-out hour every yeah. week. <laughs> um, no, the, we, we talked about Deadline Miami on two previous episodes. Mm. What's great to note is that Deadline Miami is now available for pre-order uh, through its official site. So awesome. if you Google Deadline Miami, uh, it stars the awesome Gigi Saw Guerrero and the creator of the series has a difficult name to say, but he's a very lovely, wonderful human being. His name is Vishal Berser- Berserk Wolf Rajput. And I've probably butchered that and I apologize, but he's a really amazingly sweet, talented guy. He's uh, given me a lot of insight into the... I, it's something where when we go to Vancouver in February, I'd like to, to meet up with him and maybe yeah. do a small mini interview of some sort because he seems like an incredibly... Ooh, talent is can we do a VBAF F podcast? That'd be oh my god! Ask, we'll, we should ask David if we can do a live one. Oh, that'd be kind of cool. That would be so cool. You heard it here first. This was the moment that that, that this yeah, idea and, happened. And if it doesn't happen, we know where to cut. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very true. So uh, yeah, uh, hit that new comic deadline, Mammy. There's 250 copies. I think they've sold over 100 already. So and it's oh, only shit, been like really? it's okay, been I need to get week. on that. Yeah, it's been like less than a week. I'm the same. I've been like, wait till I get paid, but I really, yeah, I really like, want it. Can it last till the 25th? <laughs> yeah, Jeez, it's, it's gonna be close. It looks, it looks amazing. And yeah. um, the art is super cool. And the style and everything is so up my alley. So big, big shout out, big props. And you know what? You did it. You released something. Uh, it's your second comic as well. So sweet. Keep doing your stuff. Keep creating your art. Um, the second shout out we'd like to give is. For I've forgotten. I know that one of them was for uh, a, a music, music video. video. <laughs> yeah, you want to do that one? No, you do that one. Okay, that's more your. Uh, we're gonna give a shout out to Evan Murphy, who uh, by the time this podcast is on Patreon should be out. Uh, music video for a little bit more, uh, directed by yours truly, starring Aaron Walsh, who's in our studio audience today. <laughs> um, he waved. You can't see it. Trust me. Um, yeah, so uh, that should be out and circulating the web. So go find Evan on Facebook. Give him a like, thumbs up, share. Evan love. Murphy musician. No, Evan Murphy official. Evan Murphy official. Yeah, um, yeah and just in case, uh, I also did a music video for him for a song called Mandy. So you can go through his YouTube and check that out too. Mm-hmm. It's it's not as good as Barry's. And then I can't remember what the yeah you haven't seen mine yet. <laughs> <laughs> I know all. I don't need to see yours. I do still really love the Mandy music video. Yeah, I, I like we're going to get into that soon anyway. Um, and I, the third shout out is can't believe it's gone from my brain. God damn. Um, it'll come to me halfway through the podcast probably. So for I'm now, glad you didn't write it down or anything. Yeah, that would be that would have been a sensible thing. To yeah, do. pity you'd know where to write it down. I know it's not like I have any kind of. I didn't couldn't find a pen. Um, <laughs> So, as per usual though, a couple of other little quick shout outs. The Three Don'ts is available right now at the three don'ts.com. Pre orders for the DVD and the Blu ray featuring the film, uh, an hour behind the scenes, uh, deleted scenes, and a, a hilarious blooper reel. So, by the time you're listening to this, it could be sold out. Hopefully uh, it is, and hopefully it isn't for you. Hopefully it is for us. And if it isn't, you should buy one. And if it is, you should just try to buy one so that it tells you, oh, this is out of stock. And then you message us and say, hey, get it. Are those going out? And we're like swimming in money. And we're like, <laughs> that's such a lie. <laughs> even if we sell every copy, we will not be swimming we in We break money. even. <laughs> but we will be able to print more. So yeah, yeah definitely check that out. It's, it's a fun film. And it's going to be doing the rounds for the next while. We're going to be singing its praises, championing it from the mountaintops because we're so damn proud of it. Damn right. 
Uh, a, lot of, a lot of work went into it, and I think we're we're really really happy with the, what we've produced and brought together. So. And it's such a film to see with a studio audience or our studio audience. <laughs> God damn it, I'm in the lingo now. It's such a film to see with a crowd. Yeah, so 100%. hopefully as screenings start to happen uh, across Ireland, across the UK, across the US, if you're watching this and you have a chance to go see it live or in, you know, in the theatre, do. It's such a cinema film. It's just yeah, the, the vibe is so good. Um, secondly, and yet again, Retribution is still available at Real House and Amazon. I suggest um, but please sponsor us Amazon. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's no, it's it's going quite well. Uh, got a review came out this week from Adam the Movie God. Uh, he was he gave a seven point five out of ten, which I'll take. Yeah, that's and pretty sweet. He said some very very positive things about the film, which was great. Mm. I'm yet again so happy with that film, so proud of it. So yep. And finally, we want to give uh, another shout out to our uh, patrons uh, over on patreon.com forward slash Celtic Badger Media. Um, those guys get to see the podcast and a whole bunch of behind the scenes and extras that uh, may not go up anywhere else. They may only live on Patreon. Some things we will plug out on Facebook, but patrons will always get prior access. A great example of something that nobody else will, like, for example, will ever get is that Savior BTS teaser. Yeah, the little sizzle reel yeah. for the BTS. Really like, cool. It's one of my favorite little things that's been put out of late, and it's only available on Patreon. Yeah. It's not going to Facebook. It's no. not getting released anywhere else. I mean, it's the type of thing where I'm looking and there's might possibly be exclusive footage from the don'ts, like small clips, mm -hmm. like one and a half minutes footage of the movie and stuff that might make their way onto our Patreon that won't be seen anywhere else as yeah. well. So if you are a fan of what we do, it's not about the money. Honestly, I know as much as I joke about it all the time and I'm like, I'm the one that's always like, oh, pay us. Like genuinely, it's as much about just we want to validate that you want this stuff. Yeah. And so we basically we are looking for ways to to make it worth your while to to be a part of that exclusive club and kind of make content for you guys because that's why we make stuff in the first place. And even though this is going to be way later that this goes out, hopefully by the point that you're watching this or listening to it, we've gotten better at putting out questions and stuff for the podcast. Oh, that yeah. it's all a learning process and we're sorry, but I mean, five podcasts in, we're so six today, it's starting <laughs> to come together. It's yeah. start, we're starting to figure it out and don't worry, we will get better um, with your support. So, speaking of figure it out... Uh, <laughs> oh, that was such a beautiful... I know, right? I couldn't let it go. I couldn't yes. let it go. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, our guest for the, today's podcast is a uh, singer-songwriter, uh, musician, all-around wonderful being, uh, award-winning composer, uh, Mr. Evan My Irby. cousin. You forgot that he was my cousin. Uh, yeah, that's, yeah. Not a, that's not an accolade. <laughs> it is. Right? No. Fucking genetics are not an accolade. <laughs> Hi guys, how are you going on? Hi Evan. <laughs> Hi Evan. <laughs> I can't believe you made that pun. <laughs> so like, oh yeah, like... Uh, I swear to God, anytime anyone says figure it out, it's like, it's just... It's so hard, it's just... In any, you don't have to be there. Yeah. It doesn't have to be in a badger situation. I'll be at fucking work in Galway and it'll be like someone will say, oh yeah, we will figure that out. I'm like... <laughs> Yeah, you, you, that song, like, yeah. because it's tied in with the dance, has almost become a meme of its own. It is. Yeah. Um, oh no, I need, I need another one. Let's, let's veer off the, the puns. Uh, okay. I think that's fair. Um, I, I nearly, nearly devolved into a second one. Um, so, Evan. Yes. I, thanks for being here with us. Thanks for having me on. Um, so, what you up to? <laughs> Smooth. <laughs> well, <thanks. laughs> No, we normally um, ask, like, we normally go, like, how'd you get into this? Yeah, you know, kind of... But I... The, the music, or, like, the music in general? Tell me about when you were five. <laughs> Tell them your baby. <laughs> when I was what five. Is <laughs> what is this? <laughs> oh, no, okay, I'm going to let Barry take over you. You, oh, you wish you'd be it's the only way. <sighs> okay, so I... <laughs> Uh, tell us a little bit about how you got involved with music, uh, kind of where that stemmed from, uh, kind of a couple of your accomplishments, and how you kind of got in touch with the Badgers and stuff like okay. that. Okay. Um, well, music was actually a funny one, because my mother bought me a guitar when I was about eight, and then it spent eight years sitting in the corner of my bedroom. 
and it never got touched. <laughs> nice. And if you've ever played a guitar with eight-year-old strings, it's horrible. <laughs> I've done that. Just, just like, yeah, the first Right, and I wouldn't mind. Fingers. But I played it for about two months and the strings never broke. But then when I goes, I really should change these, I, <laughs> I down-tuned about half a step and the strings just went, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> <laughs> They were just so used to yeah. being at that tension. Uh, that they couldn't handle it yet. Yeah. Like, Please be, I'm going to die. <laughs> but um, yeah, then when I was about 16, I decided to pick up the guitar and just, I, start, I started playing, I taught myself everything. And it was actually Fall Out Boy. I was listening nice. to it when I was 16. I was listening to Fall Out Boy, I was like, oh man, I'd love to do that. Like, I think I was watching, um, was it Thanks for the Memories, the video, and like, the, yeah. 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 And I was like, oh, just the idea of, having that and like making the music videos and stuff and having so that vibe it was as much about kind of to kind of put it in perspective it was as much about the kind of entertainment side of it like yeah. not specifically the music yeah yeah exclusively it was like the showmanship and yeah. The, yeah and that's what my i've grown to love because people i was like even my friends they asked me they're like oh do you know how do you get up in front of all these people and talk i'm like i love it mm. i love jumping up on stage and just like Getting and then when you get like a bit of the audience to interact with you as well and you, you get this feedback, I was like, I love being it's kinda of like a position of power kind of a thing. <laughs> where you're just there. But it's it's not even that, I just enjoy it. Yeah. Like I was, I was playing um it was only an open mic night there a couple of weeks ago and it was my friend was organizing it, she needed an act uh, to open the night and I was like, Yeah, yeah, sure, I'll call down and there was this group of like six or eight people sitting right in front of me and they were absolutely loving it. And mm. I was just like having a great conversation with them from up on stage. Yeah. And when I came down, my friend was just there and he was like, how do you do, how do you do that? How do you talk to people you don't know? How do you, do you know? Well, I mean, everybody is somebody you don't know until you talk to them. Yeah. Very true. That's true too. Like. My what's, <laughs> what's really weird though is I, when I was a kid, I was really outgoing like that. The older I've gotten, I, I think everyone the same knows that I'm still very talkative, but I am much weirder about approaching new people than I used. When I was younger, I would just literally talk to yeah. anybody. I was the opposite. When I was yeah. younger, I was always afraid of talking to people. And as I got older, I just, mm. I just realized people are just people. I got a lot more closed off and I hate it. I, may, yeah. I wish I could go back to being 20 when I would just be like, hey, who are you? Let's be friends. Like, yeah. Effectively. <laughs> <laughs> Slightly, side note, uh, my sister, Niggy, is, as you know, she's quite socially conscious as well. But... When she was younger, she used to literally, like, we'd go to the playground or whatever, and she'd walk up to someone, and she's like, hi, I really like your hair, you want to be friends? <laughs> that was me. That was me as well. <laughs> it so was maybe it's a thing, because you say Nikki's now quite kind of a bit... Uh, Nikki went through a, a phase of, like, she would never talk to anyone on the phone. It I was, can't it, talk to people on the phone. When people are like, I'll ring you, I'm like, I can't do that. Yeah. I can't do it, I'm sorry. That's why no one has your number. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're only talking about number. that. Yeah. Only Barry has it. Yeah. <laughs> even Kathy doesn't just Barry. Yeah. He, he doesn't even answer me. It's like, I call him and it goes to voicemail and it's like, he's not going to look at the voicemail and I get a text message later. It's like, hey, what's up? And then if he rings me on Facebook Messenger, it's fine. But if it was a phone call, I'd be weird out by it. Welcome to the weird world of somebody with some weird form of anxiety. It's like, I'm not answering a phone call, but a Facebook messenger, that's fine. Yeah, that's like the internet. It's not a real phone call. <laughs> it's weird though that you say that, because that, that was me. I was legit, my mother said I'd go up to people and just be like, hi, let's be friends. And they'd just be like, oh, well, I'm trapped now. <laughs> I was probably like Piper, you know? Oh yeah. man, I love Piper. Um, Can we have a podcast with Piper? Oh my god. <laughs> just to do a Rick impression though. Oh yeah, just to have an entire podcast with Piper as, as Rick. Rick. <laughs> <laughs> we wanted to enjoy Good Rick. parents. <laughs> um, sorry, I jumped off and I took you off on a tangent. Um, I was just curious because, yeah, it was interesting that. I think. Can I ask a quick question though? Yeah. Do you know the way you were saying like you're at an open mic night yeah. and you're kind of talking directly to these pe six, ten people in the front of the crowd yeah. and you're having that great communication with them? Do you think if you got to do like Glastonbury or Reading or like one of the biggest festivals in the world, like, does that scare you? No. What the fuck? No, that, I, <laughs> the talk of that is just like, and the same as kind of like all the badges. It's, it's not about the money. It's not about any no. of that. It's just like having... Just re having people being like, oh, your stuff really meant a lot to me. Like the other day, um, somebody commented on um, the lyric video to figure it out, done by Paddy. Thank yeah, they just. <laughs> um, 
and <laughs> it, I, it's kind of a sad story now right but the it was just i was sitting there and next thing it came up it was like my first fan comment right i got a couple of hate mail but that's more enjoyable <laughs> as aaron was yeah, yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> but uh yeah i got this comment and it was like oh um my girlfriend broke up with me and I found this song and it made me feel so much better. Was that a little bit more? Or figure it out? Uh, figure it out. Oh, okay. And I was just looking at the comment and I was like, that's exactly what I wanted. Yeah. Do you know? I was like, maybe, well, obviously not the girlfriend to break up with him. Thing, yeah. But it, was... it helped. It touched someone. Do you know? It, it, it meant someone to someone, something to someone. Yeah. And uh, that, that's, was, that's what yeah. all good art does. Um, <laughs> I think it was the Lyric video that did it for them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, it was because they could read the lyrics. It was because that heart effect. <laughs> <laughs> well, I spent so long on that Lyric video. It was like oh. stupidly long. Like after that, I spent like two months or three months on that Lyric video. I still get compliments from it though. But what's mad is then I spent like three days on a little bit more. Yeah. And I, I think it looks way better. It's, it's, it's unreal. <laughs> Hashtag stock footage for the win. <laughs> But it just it worked. Although creating the actual calligraphy effect was yeah. the hardest part of it. Yeah. But once I had that figured out, it was like, don't. <laughs> I didn't do it. I didn't. Um, I behaved. That's amazing. Though. I I really am jealous of that ability. Like I I. But like, sorry. Uh, no, go for my it. my main thing is like uh, people are always like, oh, if you get up on that stage, everyone everyone's reaction to being on stage, being on camera, being on anything is. What if I fuck up? I'm like, so what? Mm. It's I like, I like the look in Patty's eyes. It's like, I see what you're saying. I disagree. No, I don't. <laughs> the funny thing is, anytime I've had to do any public speaking stuff, I'm always, when I was at Open Emotion, I got championed for public speaking stuff. Mm. What I had, what's interesting to me is my whole tactic with public speaking is nervous energy. I get nervous, mm. right? As soon as I'm going to go on stage, with, like the example was Games Flat Thursday 2012 or whatever, and it was like, yeah huge crowd like a couple of maybe seven eight hundred people jesus and i was like oh christ like and as soon as i get up there i just let that nervous energy take over and i start yeah. self-deprecating humor and i make jokes about the stuff that we made and people laugh and once i get that laugh i feel a little less scared yeah. and then i kind of gradually ease myself into the position yeah. um that's just my technique is just rip the piss I, out of myself <laughs> and do. i think public speaking though is a lot uh, more difficult than than music Performing. because music you have like you have your song prepared you've yeah. written it you're That's true. Y- even if when you walk out on stage even if you're nervous for the first time it's like introducing yourself or whatever you know you have that fallback of like well this is a song that I'm prepared to do yeah. and then during the song you'll either see people like nodding along awesome. it's like awesome they're into it it's like then you can kind of like gauge where you are <laughs> Whereas, like you said, with the public speaking, you start out with, like, a joke, and it's like, if they, if they laugh, they're on my side. If they don't, we're fucked. Yeah, <laughs> legit. That's, it's so true, actually. I guess that's it. I mean, it's been years since I played with a band, so yeah. that feeling is kind of... I used to remember, like, you, you say that I would go out and I didn't give a shit if there was 50 people or 500 yeah. people. I just had fun and just yeah, played, yeah. and I'd wear city hats. That was my gag when I was <laughs> playing bass for Barfield. I'd come nice. wear, like, a jester hat or some shit and just have fun. And like I would see that like Alan, who was our lead singer, would be nervous because yeah. he. But I would take over a lot of the speaking to crowd opportunities then because I'd see that he'd be nervous mm. and I'd be like, but somebody's got to like, yeah, because yeah. otherwise the crowd not going to turn on you, but they're gonna. It's funny. It just dawned on me that all three of us here are musicians and we've all played in bands in different yeah. roles. You were a drummer, role, yeah. You play everything. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm in bands though. I've only ever played guitar, guitar. Or, and yeah. or sang. And then for me, it was bass. That's, we should start a band. Oh, guys. <laughs> <laughs> the Badger Band. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Badger House Band. What was, what was the one you want to do for the Smile video? The Badger Set. Oh, a Badger Set. A Badger Set. On a Badger Set. Playing a Badger Set. <laughs> it's it's got to happen. That's, that's Chris Nolan levels of like <laughs> a badgerdom. <laughs> a badgerdom. Yeah. I, oh god. That's something. What? But I guess that kind of brings us to a nice little segue, which is that obviously you're no fear performing. You've no fear writing and and everything like that. Um. How did you come to be involved with the Badgers and and and? Well, it was um when I released the album in March, mm. and then I had started talking to you. 
and we didn't know that each other existed really <laughs> which existed just didn't know each other at all which yeah. is always great for cousins <laughs> yeah because like when i think you said you see me when i was two two or three yeah, yeah. like and i i size. okay i didn't know you existed <laughs> when, yeah when i was two but like and then um i think it was uh ben said to me it was like did you ever talk to paddy i was like who's, who's paddy <laughs> <laughs> yeah and he was like, your cousin, Paddy. He, I, I like that Paddy is this enigma. It's like, yeah. did you ever talk to Paddy? Who's Paddy? <laughs> <laughs> Genuinely. And it was actually, it was Halloween last year when I was doing the window painting that he said it to me. Oh, okay. Because, yeah, I would have just gone out to his house for Halloween last year. Yeah. Taking all the photos and stuff. That was fun. Yeah, so we, we actually only started talking about a year ago. Yeah. And then, um, and then I had the album released and... You enjoyed it, and you had said to me about doing the score for the don'ts, and then that's kind of when I integrated that's, into it. That's where your fearlessness just shocks me, because like the amount of people that if I came and said, "So I know you've never done any music composition stuff for film, <laughs> like you've done songs." I was scoring a film, but it's not even a short; it's a ninety-six-minute <laughs> feature film. Like most people would just be like, "Are you?" insane yeah. I love that you were like yeah cool yeah yeah. what do I do <laughs> that was it es- essentially that's what it came down to it. Like, yeah. what, do you, what do you need from me I'll, yeah. I'll do it <laughs> and then I remember when you said about the first sample clip which I think was the stitch up scene yeah. that's not a spoiler right hmm? no the, yeah. the, the, there's no context to what yeah true yeah. When you when I sent that when you sent me the clip for that I showed Baz and Aaron and Brian and I was like this is like the little sample he's done and he's done no composition before. Like mm. This is the yeah. very first thing he's ever done and we were all like, this is going in a good direction. We're but it wasn't happy. just like, this is the first thing he's ever done. It was like, you would caught the, the feel of the scene yeah. and you'd matched it musically and it flowed like, like I if you had told me that was a professional, I still would have been like, that's fucking awesome. It yeah. works. Like it, it was, doesn't... It was great. It was like just this, this... And it was funny because a lot of other people that we'd approached about composing for the don'ts didn't, in my opinion, get what I wanted, which is I wanted a real instrument for you. Yeah. There's a lot yeah. of... Now, we do still have some synth work in it and stuff, but yeah, I, I it. wanted that real instrument for you. Yeah. And when you sent that first clip on, it was the first time since we'd started doing the don'ts that I heard a guitar. Yeah. And that was what I'd wanted from yeah. day one, was like... And it was just like a... Ju- and I was like, ooh, yeah. Like that's that's the vibe of this movie. It's gritty. It's dirty. It's rough. Yeah. It's not. You know, there are scenes where a synth, like as we know, as we've seen yeah, yeah. the composition now, where a synth comes in and fits perfect. But it's not the tone of the the main tone of the movie. Yeah. And your the drum work you did in it was exceptional. Exceptional. Yeah. Like uh, the the other scene, I won't. I don't know how to phrase it. <laughs> but you know the one I'm talking about anyway, where it's it's about ten minutes. And it's all scored by drums. Do you yeah, remember that? I do it indeed. Just, yeah. And that was just, I just, I can remember, I was like, it doesn't need anything more or less yeah. than mm. that. It's so true. Um, and it, what's interesting is that was when we did the revised score for yeah. the underground cinema screening, that yeah. was one of the only segments that didn't get in any way changed. Yeah, it yeah. like it's already perfect. It just sits under it, hums away and kind of keeps it. Like, there, there, there were some mistakes. Like, do you remember um, when I exported the whole hour? And a half? <laughs> it arrived as a thirty-two second clip. No. So, first of all, so you sent on clips, individual yeah. clips, for the the, sc- the test screening that we did in May. Yeah. And what I did was I took those individual clips and just I was doing cell mix, so I just mashed them in wherever I felt they. And yeah, and I think we were still pretty happy with it. Yeah. But what was interesting was like, oh, it was interesting that you didn't choose the hour and a half long version that I sent. And I went, there was no hour and a half long version. He's like, I sent you an hour and a half long. I'm like, I'm telling you, I didn't get one. <laughs> and then he like opens it and he's like, for some reason, it's just silence. Yeah, it was 30 seconds of silence. <laughs> And it was the export, like the export was there, but when yeah. I opened it, it was just 30 seconds of silence. I was like, what happened to this? That's and amazing. so then, yeah, when we came to the underground cinema, when we had the proper full 90, 90 minute score. Yeah. Um, and onto that, I mean, you have three, three, three songs used in the film? Yeah. We've as as well as the score. Because it's, yeah. I know that we have figured out, is kind of almost become the theme of the don'ts now. Yeah. Uh, Hence the joke earlier. Yeah. 
Uh, we have Mandy in there. Uh, Normie joined the... Yeah, yeah I think yeah. Tree Sounds. Tree, yeah. Yep. Um, how did that feel? Like, on top of... It was it was really cool, and like the best part was I remember um, when Figured Out originally went in, it had a really small part, and I was happy out with that. I was just like, oh, that's really it was just cool. In the bar, was it? Yeah, it was just on the radio in the bar, and then um, and then when you came back to me and was like, oh, I want to I want to put Nomi in, and I was like, <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, cool. And then something I can't remember, like it was close to the underground cinema, I think. When you said, "Could you use Mandy as well? Like, could we could we put in Mandy?" And I was like, "Yeah, like, why not?" It was, like, it was interesting because where I ended up using Mandy without any spoilers is the character that I play. It's his ringtone, yeah. and that fits really well because you know, day one when I first heard "Take yeah. What You Will." that Mandy was my favorite song, which yeah, is why yeah. I wanted to do the music video so bad and all that. So I just thought, I was like, my character has to have Mandy's his ringtone, because mm. yeah. I love that song. So, um, yeah, and it, then... <laughs> to uh, Yeah, I guess to put that into perspective, uh, Take What You Will is the title of Evan's EP. Yes. Which is available for sale. It's on SoundCloud. Yeah, um, it's on iTunes, Spotify. Not SoundCloud, uh, Bandcamp. Uh, yeah, Bandcamp. Where you can um, pay money for it, and you should, because artists support artists. Yes, we do. <laughs> uh, yeah, but uh, that's it's another new Badger hashtag. <laughs> artists <laughs> support artists. I like it. Yeah, we can all be broke together. Yeah. <laughs> no, we can't. That's the problem. <laughs> we can be broke by supporting other artists who then make us not broke. Mm-hmm. We, might, we, we, we might as well just have a convention where we all swap fivers. <laughs> We yes. just we just need fiber to swap fiber swap gun. <laughs> I would go to fiber swap gun in a heartbeat. Oh stop, man! You can't keep passing the same fiber rooms. <laughs> That's what it's we're like here I've for. I've seen this serial code three times today. <laughs> <coughs> oh god! Um, <coughs> Actually, um, how did you record that album? Was that a self-record or no? I I did it in. Um, Open Door Studios in Limerick with Joey Mulcahy mm. and um, originally I had been looking around at a couple of different studios and stuff and then I text Joey and I was just like can I come in and like look at your studio and he was just so opening and friendly and I was like oh yeah cool yeah come on and I went in then and then um, that was September last year I started recording and I released the EP in March um, okay, that's yeah. pretty, pretty. That's incredible turnaround. Pretty quick turnaround, actually. Yeah, and, and um, you kind of built on that EP as well because it was like four tracks. That's yeah. what I always knew it is. I have a copy of it here somewhere. Yeah, like I always knew it is. Uh, figure it out, Nomi, Mandy, a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then you've added to that since I have Smile released. We have Poison is done but not released. And we're in the middle of recording a song called 1953 Ooh, that, I, that I, yeah, I just, <laughs> I just finished writing and I've showed it to four or five people and everyone seems to give the same kind of a, kind of the same way Poison has gotten it now where it's just this, they said it was kind of this infectious kind of, you just want to tap move to it, you want to mm. tap to it, you know? And I was like, oh, okay, really cool. That, that's a good thing to talk about. A lot of your music is very, with the exception of maybe a little bit more. Yeah. A lot, the, a lot of the rest of your music is very upbeat, very positive. Yeah. I think it's because you're a very upbeat, positive human being. Yeah. And that even when the subject matter might not necessarily be, the vibe is still very positive. Yeah, be. that's that's true. Because like Poison actually is like quite a dark dark song. Yeah. Like if if you take it literally, yeah, it's quite a dark song, but it's just absolutely like get up and dance you yeah. know if you that. take any song literally it's uh, <laughs> <laughs> literally it's coming soon <laughs> exclusively to Patreon uh, yeah no but it is it is one of those things where I, I like that but I'm always curious I'm always like oh, I wonder I want Evan to do something really dark and really slow and really like I, I get those moments like it's kind of like, like hurt or something like I that I don't know yeah because like, like with a little bit more it is that bit more on that spectrum yeah like it still has a bit of a positive feel but it's it is still just that bit more somber mm. but like if you take um, any of my songs they go they go through this like 
absolute roller coaster to get where they are like because uh no me sounded nothing I remember like that you showed me the original no yeah me. like yeah. no me sounded like this upbeat like yeah. brass band marching through a football stadium song right <laughs> i actually I need to hear that yeah song. it's crazy the trumpets and everything in it like <laughs> and um next thing joey just turned to me and he was like how would you feel about this and i went Delete it. <laughs> he went, what? <laughs> he was like, we spent, yeah, we spent like three weeks we're recording this. And I went, hold on a minute. And I was like, mute everything except the drums. And he was like, what are you doing? And I picked up the guitar anyway. And uh, I just changed the chords from open chords to uh, power chords. And I strummed them kind of like in, kind of like metal, do all downstrokes, like da da da. And then um, he was just kind of looking at me, kind of wondering what is going on, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and next thing I was what like, are you? Yeah, I was like, okay, give me a mic. And then, like, because uh, Nomi was really high. If you hear the backing vocals in Nomi, mm. they were originally the main vocals. Ah, oh, okay. And then uh, I flipped it and I put the lows as the main vocals the main and I started vocals, singing yeah. really low I just I brought in and I can remember Joey like because this was just a rough track that I was putting back down I was singing into the microphone and next thing Joey just turned around and went I didn't know you could do that and we went <laughs> me neither <laughs> so. it, it's funny actually that you're, you talk about that because uh, me and a friend of mine Andy recorded uh, his entire full length album in uh, my house in Athlone <laughs> I need to show it to you actually yeah. but it was all it was all self recorded and um, I, I produced the whole album, but there was one song in particular that he was like, because he was a singer songwriter, but he wanted to do the album full band. Yeah. And there was one song in particular that, like, in, in the full band context, the the vocal line that he had picked was just like it just didn't fit well with mm. the full band feel. So I was like, okay, it was like you know the tempo, you know where every one comes in. It's like just. Erase it from scratch. He was like, start on a different note and just sing. And uh, he did like two or three takes, and then we found one that worked. And I was like, oh, that, that's the one. He was like, we'll use that as the main line. And then he was like, but I, I don't know how to harmonize it because I haven't been singing it that way. And I was like, let me mute it. And I was like, do the old line. And he did the old yeah. vocal line. And because they were all the same beats and they all fit in, it just, it just worked, worked as a harmony yeah. because of what he was used to singing and it was like that was such a cool moment it was <laughs> like oh, awesome. I can't believe that worked and it sounds so good yeah. I we had to re when I was with Fairfield we had to reverse the vocals so many times because <laughs> I would get so used to hearing Bondi singing the main vocal line that then he'd be like okay you're coming in with the harmonies now on this and I'm like okay and then I'd sing the main vocal line and he'd be like no no you're on the high I'm on the low and I'm like yeah no problem we go again and I come in on the low and he's like no like, and I'm like I'm sorry it's what I just I'm so used to hearing that yeah. and so then he'd be like look I'll do the high you do the low and we, we ended up having to do that a bunch of times and come, for live performances more or less all the time it would be like you do all my parts I'll do all yours yeah we, we I used to be in part of a band called uh, Bobo they were like in a acoustic trio but they brought me into like some additional percussion and stuff like nice. that from time to time but uh it was really cool writing with them because uh the main singer liam he would like come up with a vocal line and then he'd come up with a harmony and brian used to play guitar and do the harmonies so he'd like they'd swap and they'd be like which line are you more comfortable doing it's oh, like nice. we do this line and this line it's like which one you know Where do you works for you yeah, yeah. it was really cool to to watch that progression, I'm like, are you talented motherfuckers? I know. I I think that when, with, when I'm around this guy, it wrecks my head. He's just yeah. like, oh, so I just did this amazingly talented thing in like 20 minutes. I'm like, oh, I'm going to go drive off a bridge into the chair. <laughs> it's like, you heard it here first. <laughs> no, genuinely, it is, yeah. it's hard to take sometimes. No, I think as I've gotten older and I've gotten wiser, uh, I've I've become more attuned to the fact that I have my own talents and yeah. I'm good at certain things and that's fine and I'm happy with that but it's still frustrating when I see people who are good at so many things because yeah. I'm just like why can't I be good at more things like that and then I think it's in the genetics and I'm like but we're in the same family that's not fair where's my genetics damn it <laughs> um, yeah so uh, I'm sure I think I mean as you see Ooh. yeah just uh, going back to the EP for just a minute like mm -hmm. uh, you said you did that at the studio you record all the instruments then 
Uh, yeah, any ones that we didn't uh, use the VTS for and uh, mm. all the virtual instruments, but most of the things now was all me. Like even I did my own backing vocals, which was weird because I've had so many people ask me who's the girl in Mandy. <laughs> <laughs> And like Mandy, that's, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, "No, it's not. Who's the Who's the girl singer doing the backing vocals?" I'm like, "Yeah, that's me." <laughs> I swear to God, you just need to make up like that's Mandy. <laughs> oh, it's I got Brian. to guest track. There, there is a Mandy. If you, if you watch the music video, it's Brian. <laughs> yeah, Brian the mannequin. Who <laughs> comes to life? Is that what the mannequin was called? Yeah, yeah. Brian. I was like, Oregon wasn't in that music. Yeah, video. it was. It, it was an interesting <laughs> shoes. <laughs> quite funny uh, that was an interesting shoot I had to wash my couch oh because Jade's been <laughs> yeah. over it. my little sister like poured beer middle middle of a shot of a shot while we were like, rolling oh, and no. she poured a beer straight down my back uh. I, 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 she was talking to someone or something and she just went <laughs> she literally if you watch the clip she just went like, it almost got, it looked conscious it didn't look like an accident because she literally is just talking it goes <laughs> oh god <laughs> on a similar note the in the canteen that I in the place that I used to work, there was this one girl. Uh, I won't say her name because it, this is a really funny story. And I'm Rebecca. Sure she'd be very bad. We'll call her Rebecca. Oh, damn it! I nailed it there. <laughs> Rebecca was very vocal and ta- always talking with her hands, always, which is always funny in science. But uh, we were on we were on lunch one day, and uh, she she started talking to someone, and she opened her orange juice. But then she got really excited, so she put down the orange juice and she kept talking about them. And then she, she got distracted. She forgot she took the top off the orange juice. <laughs> she went to shake it, drowned everyone at the table, everyone at the next table over, and just like covered everyone in orange juice. Um, she had to go home. She was very embarrassed. <laughs> Thanks, Rebecca. I, uh, yeah, I, uh, I talk oh about my hands as well. I mm. try not to on the podcast. I try to like be as rigid as I can, but on set, I'm terrible for it. He's tied to the chair. You just can't. <laughs> I'm literally actually <laughs> tied to the chair. No, on set, it's all like all exaggerated movements. Yeah, Mike Shawcross struggles to get your director's point. I, I don't point that much. It's just all this like flamboyant. <laughs> <laughs> That's why my hands are tying back up there. <laughs> so I guess uh, speaking of film and moving in that general yeah. direction, I'm all about the fucking segways today, about man. the segways, about the segways. <laughs> Um, like the flow. <laughs> <laughs> Since you've gotten involved with the Badgers and stuff like that, you've actually came on uh, a couple of sets now. Um, yeah. How do you find the differences between like the music, working with music and kind of working with a bunch of people on a film set? I find it, I find it great because like the Badgers are just such a good team though. Like everyone works so well, and like everyone has their jobs and stuff. And I was only I was only saying it the other day. I was on. Um, I was on a, like a, a student show mm. and they were saying, oh, I wish I had a director. And I was telling them about, you know, I was like, oh, we were shooting last weekend. I was like, you've no idea. I was like, Patty, just like, you know, and everyone is where they need to be. I was like, it's just unbelievable to watch, you know. And then it's, it's different with me because I don't have a band. It's just mm. I guide everything. <laughs> so yeah. I'm, it's the same thing. It's just it, it's it is the same thing in so many ways, because what I find is when you're on a set with the Badgers, when I'm on a set with the Badgers, I, I, as you say, it's guiding. It's like, I need you here. I need yeah. you doing this. I need that. But because we work so well together, it literally feels like you could be doing it about yourself. Yeah. And that's not like a detriment. Yeah. That's, the, that's the positive of it is it's so instinctive and everyone just, you don't get a, but why am I going there? Why am I? And sometimes mm. that's needed, fair enough, especially yeah. from actors. But like, it's not like you don't have to battle everyone on every point. You don't yeah. have to explain why this has to happen this way or, you know, People are just like, yeah, cool, gotcha, bro. Like, and so I think in a lot of ways they're probably quite similar. Like, you're yeah. effectively telling yourself, "This is what we got to do, bro." <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we, I guess I work with Joey as well, and me yeah. and me and Joey. I remember one day um, we were sitting there, we we're listening back to one of the tracks and stuff. And next thing he turned around, he was like, "It's missing something." This is a poison. And then he turned around, and I was like sitting really weirdly on a chair. I was like standing on the chair, but sitting on the back of the chair, <laughs> and he was just like. <laughs> what what are you doing? <laughs> I was like, yeah, it, it is missing something. And then he was like, what about a harp? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah, I, I love that. That's the sort of stuff that's thrown out. <laughs> yeah, what about a harp? And next thing I went, okay. So I sat down at the MIDI board anyway, and me and Joey were there, and we 
got up we've figured out chords and stuff because poison doesn't actually have any chords in it it's it's really it's really strange yeah i know i i was so confused i'm trying to remember like i, dun, I know you dun, sent me <laughs> yeah yeah it's, yeah I, it's it's got formations but like if you try put them into a chord they don't actually recognize as chords yeah um but anyway, so we, we copied we copied like a rough idea we got from playing the bass line and stuff of where the chords should be. I love that bass line. If there's one thing I absolutely adore about Poison, it's that chunky bass. That was Joey. Joey so sick. Joey just, he so like, sick. he texted me like a week later. He was like, man, I've been working like mad on Poison. And he was like, I just had to, like, I had this bass line as soon as you showed me the song. I wanted this bass line. I'm always biased on that stuff because I was a yeah. bassist though. So I'm always like listening out for the bass line. The bass line is so sick in it though. But yeah. it's, the bass line is so important in, in every, and it's the joke that musicians make. Yeah. It's the bassist is always the first to be the joke. Like, oh, yeah. his bass is like, he doesn't, you know. Or, or, and the or drummers, drummers, yeah. And that's why the bass and drums stick together when yeah. you're in a band. It's, it's like, we gotta stick together like, because those guys are dicks. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck those guys. <laughs> We're holding this whole fucking thing together. <laughs> but even in my old band I always used to slag the basses and the drummer but like I do think they are almost more important than I am <laughs> genuinely like maybe that's why we've always had such I a connection maybe it yeah. is like, cause that's so funny because we, we were both musicians before we got into filmmaking yeah. and, and, and we it, just had an instant connection so maybe and maybe it's our roles are actually so similar to those roles we just don't realise <laughs> Badger your brain blown. We need to add animation oh, no. for that. We're not adding animation to the podcast. Um, that's, uh, no, I, I, it's one of those things, though, where, like, I do, like, a guy at college yesterday put on this song while I was working away. And straight away, I looked, look at him, and I'm like, oh, my God, that bass line is so cool. Hmm. And he's like, what bass line? And I'm like, the thing running at the heart of that song you're listening yeah. to. And he's like, oh, I just heard a guitar and drums. And I'm like, it's so much you don't know yeah. now it was a metal song bass was tuned down in like drop D or drop C maybe sludge so it was pretty sludgy like, but the bass line was unreal yeah. and I was like oh, it upsets me that you don't know that it upsets me yeah. that you can't hear that and he's just like I don't hear the bass I'm like, yeah. it, it's so funny because I for anyone who's, who's good at googling I used to do a music review show on the internet ah. and uh <laughs> <laughs> it's all coming out now. No, 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 it's fine. It's very embarrassing. It was like, literally, it was like one man talking to camera type setup. I've seen O'Regan's boxing vi- unboxing videos. Yours cannot be. <laughs> Your okay. embarrassing videos cannot be that. Oh, uh, yeah, and I I did all the like titles and three D graphics and everything. Oh, and, yeah, it, like it, was it that was, through Black Road. Yeah, it was just just uh, yourself. Yeah, it was just the thing that I started a, started a channel, and I was like, "This is going to be my career. I'm going to be doing this." And can you review Evan stuff now. I can review Evan yeah. stuff like it live. Yeah. Jerry <laughs> <laughs> looked down the camera. I can't do it without my teleprompter. I, no, I, I swear to God, I I, build, I built a teleprompter. Like oh, it God. was out of an iPad and a piece of. Uh, it was actually a a glass picture frame. That, oh wait. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's Pretty photos cool. on my Instagram of my, my ghetto <laughs> teleprompter. Ghetto teleprompter is a great name for a band. <laughs> <laughs> we but, are um, ghetto teleprompter. But I used to do that, and because I had kind of I played guitar and I played bass and I played drums and kind of mainly focused on drums. But it was like every song that I got in, even if I didn't dig the song, there was like parts and elements that yeah. I could latch onto. I was like, oh, the bass is really sick here, and you know the guitar looks really cool. This vocal line is class, and. Even if the song wasn't for me, there was always something in it that I was like, I, I can focus on. This is kind of interesting to me because I've been thinking a lot about criticism in the last couple of weeks. And I was formerly a video game re- reviewer and critic. And even in the, there was only one game in the entire five years that I was doing reviews that I tore apart. And I think it hurt me because it was an Adventure Time game. And I'm such a big Adventure Time fan. That I just felt like it, it just felt like a cash grab, and I just was so angry that I wrote like a scathing review. Um, but ninety nine percent of the time, I wrote reviews that I I tried to. I felt it was my responsibility as a reviewer to not just be like, "This is awful," because like, it's it's the type of thing where I'd always go, "Look, you know, these mechanics don't really work for me. I'm not even trying to the combat, but like the design is really cool, and the character design and some of the dialogue." Like, I'd always try to find the stuff that you could say is good about it yeah. while pointing out the negatives. 
And yeah. I feel like that's a responsibility that critics are falling away from, like where it's become more about who can say the nastiest, meanest thing to yeah. get clicks. Um, I know that there's one video game reviewer who specifically gives massive tentpole games, like two out of tens, just because he knows that it'll draw a shit ton of traffic to his site. Because people will come on arguing with him, going, why are you saying this game? It's yeah. amazing. You know. Um, yeah. It's, it is one of those things, like, there's people who do it just for the, the trolling aspect. And in the same way, like, Casey is a good example with the fucking Emoji movie. Like, everyone was like, this is a bad movie. There is no point in watching this. And he was like, I'm going to say it's a good movie. <laughs> just, just to be that person. Yeah. And, and the internet is part of that culture of, like, the, again, we've talked about the Star Wars thing a couple of times. Like where the, people just retroactively... Yeah, where The Force like, Awakens, yeah. where yeah. people were like, oh, Force Awakens is really cool, and then other people have come out and like, oh, well, it's not really great, it's just the same as the other thing. And they're like, yeah, I don't like it anymore. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> but oh, oh, why does what he's saying... Have self-respect, you fuck. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, I really liked The Force yeah. Awakens. I thought it, like, it was really good. Like, it was... There was nothing standout-ish that it was like, this is the best Star Wars film of all time or whatever, but I really liked it. And I legit sat there and I was like, if I was seven years old and I was brought to this and this was my introduction to Star Wars, I would be a happy fucking yeah. kid. Yeah. Like, you know? And I was like, and that's what Star Wars should be. Mm. Like, see you, the, the, like, not trying to be, because we were in that age bracket, like, to some extent, but like, see you, Mr. 35, 40 year old man, who's like, this isn't my Star Wars, well, we're not in that age bracket, I guess. Oh, just outside it. Oh, it hurts, I'm so we're close. Outside it. <laughs> we're, we're, we're outside it. But we're in there. <laughs> uh, but no, the, uh, like, the people that are like, especially people who are a bit older than us, who are like, grew up and went to see Star Wars in the cinema when they were kids. Yeah. And they're like, oh, this isn't my Star Wars. You're like, you're right, it's not your fucking Star Wars. Yeah. yeah. Your Star Wars came out in 77 when you fucking watched it in the cinema. This is their Star Wars. Yeah. And even the prequels, which I have no respect for, <laughs> to get completely blunt about it. Well, to be, to be fair, that was our Star Wars. We, we were kids when that came out. And even at, at, at kid kids. level, we were like... But someone like Jess will argue that the Jess was on our previous podcast. You can check that out. Episode five. It's really good. It's Jess and Fake. Jess was like, Star Wars episode one was my Star Wars. And I loved it. Mm. And I would never try to tell Jess that she shouldn't. Yeah. That's what mm. I don't get about this modern day culture. It's like, I like something. Well, I'm going to tell you why you should dislike it. Yeah. yeah. It's like, why? It's like, it's like you're not allowed to have an opinion anymore. Do you know? Yeah. Or you can have an opinion, but I'm going to tell you why your opinion is wrong and break it down. And sh- it becomes more about, well, my opinion is right and yours is wrong. And it's like, or can we just all have opinions? Opinions yeah. are like assholes. <laughs> yeah. Everyone has one and none of them are the same. I always say everyone has one and they're usually full of shit. <laughs> <laughs> that too. <laughs> like, it, it's, it is. It's, I think that's, coming back to you, Evan, because we've definitely tangented off. And that's what podcasts are for. Yes. Um, but coming back, like, I mean, does that... What was your Star Wars? <laughs> what was your Star Wars? <laughs> like, my, one of my you favorite characters. To the every week list. <laughs> <laughs> what was your Star Wars? Like, one of my favorite characters growing up and most memorable was Darth Maul. That's exactly what Jess said last week. Yeah. Uh, but again, uh, that was something that, like, he struck me as well. I was like, Darth Maul I thought was a great character. I thought he had a lot more room to grow. It was a pain yeah. to see him cut in half and kicked into a tube. And to get literally, I think it's seven and a half minutes screen time across the whole Phantom Menace. <sighs> but think about how iconic he is. Yeah. 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 It's still a shame, though, because yeah. I still feel like, like you say, they had so much opportunity. And mm. they did. With the Clone Wars, they brought him back and stuff. And yeah. You know, I, I didn't watch any of the Clone Wars. They're so though. good. Man. I've heard that. But so good. Just, there's a time... <laughs> but you're spot on. Joan's really crazy. I was watching Insidious again recently. <laughs> and like, it was just on Halloween. It's fine. Yeah, and plus I, I listened to a podcast with Lee One Ellen and I was like, oh, mm-hmm. they were talking about Insidious a lot and how that was like, they in effect you thought their careers was, was over, which is crazy. You're looking at like James Wan and Lee One Ellen and you're like, what? No. Like you're like the biggest people in horror. But they done Saw, biggest franchise mm-hmm. of all time. Love Saw. And then yeah. they did Dead Silence, which was not received well at all. That one with the puppets. Yeah, I loved, I loved that film. But yeah. it was not received well critically or commercially. Then they did Death Sentence with Kevin Bacon, which was yet again an unbelievably good revenge film. I think the more I've thought about it in retrospect, Death Sentence actually had a massive influence on Retribution as well. Just not aesthetically, but definitely at the narrative side of it. Mm. But at that point, they were like, nobody's booking us in Hollywood. We're we're not going to keep doing this. And yeah. 
they literally Jason Blum came up and was like I got a million bucks go make a movie for me which was the exact same setup as how they met Saul like, yeah. they were literally back after eight years at square one like and they were like well let's not look at it as being back at square one let's embrace it like when we had that those constraints that was when we met our best stuff yeah yeah um I don't know where I went off this tangent. Insidious. <laughs> Insidious. I like the way you tried to bring it back, and we just went on a further tangent down like, the same road. Like, where am I going? <laughs> uh, it was. I was watching Insidious, and literally when the demon appeared, I was like, "Oh my god, it's Darth Maul." <laughs> I that too. Yeah. but like that was probably in the last like I, I'm terrible for being one of these people like I don't go around going oh it's not scary it's crap blah blah but uh, like I'm, I'm one of these people that it takes a lot to scare me and Insidious actually did it and it was that conversation you know, that's flicking over and back yes and next thing the yes. demon appears and I went oh my god and I was like that was actually good I yeah. enjoyed that little jump you know Insidious is one that when I first saw it I didn't appreciate it enough when I first saw it, I was like, yeah, it was all right. It was okay. It was pretty good. And then I've gone back and watched it like six, seven years later, and I'm like, oh my, this was actually fucking brilliant, you know? Yeah. Um, and now I'm like, oh God, I'm going to go watch all the sequels. I really watched the third one because I've heard really good things about it, the one that Lee Wanell directed. Yeah, I haven't. It's apparently a lot, of, a lot of one shots and tracking shots. Oh, don't say it to me. I'll have to go watch it this evening. <laughs> uh, I'm actually going to watch Ragnarok this evening. So jealous! <laughs> so jealous! Uh, we're this like 4th of November recording this and like by the time this comes out everyone will be like oh Ragnarok that's like so two months ago oh my god <laughs> pretty much nobody's even talking about the Ragnarok and this is the age we live in it sucks yeah. um, well, we're gonna talk about Ragnarok right now no we're not I haven't seen it what <laughs> would you say that there was any direct artist that had like a major influence musically music? on you um, and likewise because you do music and film is there any specific film or that had a big effect on you. Musically is actually. Um, <laughs> we put in a sound effect on the void. <laughs> <laughs> uh, musically is most definitely an artist that a lot of people don't know, John Butler. Oh, oh I love John, John, John Butler. John but, like, that's great. You know him, right? But uh, every other person I go to, like John Butler, and they're like, "Who's that?" But, like he, he only has. I think he only has about 120,000 followers. I know it's a lot more than we have, but when you... He's not a mainstream artist, but yeah. I think musicians know him. Yeah. yeah. You know, he's that kind of artist. But uh, he was one of my biggest influences. I seen him about two years ago, and I actually got the chance to meet him. Or no, actually, it was five years ago. And I got the chance to meet him. Was that when he was playing as the trio? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, nice. And I'm so upset that I missed that chance because oh, I was... Oh, you didn't actually meet him. I was 17. I was in Dublin. I had no money, and my bus was leaving. Oh no! And the his manager came up and goes, "Do you want to meet him?" Straight out, just said, "Do you want to meet him?" And I went, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, yeah." And he goes, "All right, come wait over here." And I was waiting, and waiting, and waiting, and waiting. And next thing, one of the lads came up to me and goes, "Look, Ev, you have to make a choice. It's either you sleep." And I thought about it. He was like, "You either sleep on the street." or you get the bus home now with us like it's leaving and I was sitting there and I goes do you know what I don't actually have a money to get a bus home tomorrow I was like I have no problem sleeping on the street like that's okay but how do I get home tomorrow oh my god I feel so bad for you that's like yeah. Sophie's choice man that's like that's, there is no right answer yeah. there is that no. is horrendous and I can't believe you had to make that decision at 17 he did give us free stuff though Okay. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, he gave us free posters and stuff. Because um, we made we made T-shirts going up on the bus. Oh, and stuff. <laughs> yeah, we still have them. Me and my mates. Slightly similar but different. Uh, I had a chance to meet Phil DeFranco when he was in Galway. Oh, cool, yeah. Uh, I know how much of a big fan. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm a huge fan of Phil DeFranco. I think he's like, he's just he's really taken what he wants to do and like with the ad apocalypse and stuff like that. Now he's having I don't want to say he's having a tough time because he is probably one of the best run patrons. Yeah, Patreon pages definitely. out there uh, but um, like everything he's doing is being demonetized by YouTube so mm. be, it, without his sponsors and his patrons he wouldn't be able to keep going the way he is but he was uh, in Galway he was came over to Dublin his friends were getting married in Dublin so he came over and then he was like well while I'm here I'm going to go around Galway is this around the time of the shoot? because I vaguely remember you being like he's tweeting that he's in Ireland yeah was- it, there was but there was a stage where he was in Galway and I was like, he messaged to say that he was in Galway. And I was like, I'm gonna go into Galway and I'm gonna try and meet him. It's like, it may not happen, uh, you know, but I, I'd kill myself if I didn't try. Yeah. So I drove into Galway 
and uh, just kind of hung around. I sent him a couple of messages. Uh, he didn't get back. He didn't tweet that he was anywhere else. So I was just kind of like wandering around. I was like, well, if I was Phil DeFranco and I was in Galway, where would I go? So I just kind of went to like the major spots in Galway, like the big name pubs and stuff like that. And after a while, it was like uh, Vashon was just finishing up work and stuff like that. And it was lashing rain. It was like, oh, I can't let her walk home. It was like, so I'll... I, I guess I'll just head home. Give up the ghost. And I, I literally, like, I got in the car. I was, like, 10 minutes away. I'd literally just gone past the Oren Moore exit on the motorway. And my phone messages, it was Phil. He was like, hey, we're in this pub. If you want to come down and meet us. I was like, I'm literally at a point where I can't turn around until I hit Loch Ray. Oh and I was God. like, and he was like, we'll probably only be here for about a half hour, 40 minutes. I was like, but oh. if you want to come down and meet me. I was like, oh, Damn. I was like, I would love to, is like, because I had my old source fed t-shirts that they had oh, made and everything, and I was like, oh, I just want to meet him and just like, genuinely tell him that like, what he's done yeah, has it's been really cool, influence. and yeah. But that is something that I find amazing, and I think it's why, I don't know, it's why I like working with you guys and stuff, because I feel like we're all so similar, but like, I think we appreciate art, it's not that we... It's not that we're celebrity chasers, we're not fanboys, we're not whatever. It's mm. like, if somebody's art, it's me with Adam Green and Joe, as I've told you in London, like, yeah. their art connects with me. Like, mm. I didn't want to meet them because they're Adam and Joe and they're celebrities or icons or whatever. Yeah. It's like, your art resonates with me. I want to be able to tell you that face to face. Like Exactly. Like, I yeah. mean, I, I wasn't chasing that photograph. Yeah. It's like, I didn't want to photograph with Phil. I wanted to sit down, shake his hand and tell him, like he's just a good guy and nice. I really liked you know yeah. everything he's done I really respect what he's done and the hustle that he has I, I told you about my Ruth Nega story at yeah. Galway Film Flat where like everyone was like running up and getting selfies with her and whatever but it was legit like very like oh hey can I get a selfie thanks bye and I was like she's a human being like. yeah. Yeah. so I remember chatting to her for like 20 minutes in the Radisson and I legit was delighted my phone battery was dead and I could not be any happier because mm-hmm. I was like and everyone will be like, oh, you could say you didn't meet her, you whatever. I don't give a shit. I had that experience yeah. and I'm so yeah, happy. Yeah. I told her about the don'ts. She was laughing because she's from Limerick. <laughs> talked about chicken. We talked about chicken hot. Here he was making me like, the one thing I miss about Limerick is chicken hot. I was like, come home. <laughs> chicken hot. But I just was like, this experience was so much more worthwhile. Like if I was like all conscious of like, and I remember Martin Nee running up and be like, do you want me to grab a photo of you guys? And I was like, no, it's fine. It's fine. Thank you. Like so, Martin can attest to this. <laughs> uh, that was my first meeting with Martin. Um, but yeah, I, I think, as you say, that is what we're in it for. It's not like, yeah. oh, I'll get a quick selfie and stick it on Instagram. Yeah, it's yeah. like I get a hundred thousand likes. Yeah, or it's it's like I want if there's somebody that resonates with me, mm. I want to be able to just look them in the eye and just say thank you. Yeah, and seriously. Yeah. And so I think we all get them because we work together. Mm. And it's the same thing that we want. Like we don't want yeah. people come up to us because we we did this or did that. It's because it's like, oh, I really enjoyed that. It's yeah. my favorite thing with yeah. Coppa. The amount of people with with all the things we've done, the most the one that most people come up and are just like, thank you for Coppa. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, what? Because <laughs> yeah. it's such a messed up, but it just obviously taps into something yeah. Yeah. that people just genuinely watch and, and it resonates with them, which is yeah. amazing. Um, so I mean, I, but I think that's something about music. Music yeah. is a very primal way of connecting with people because yeah. it's not, film you're using a, I know music using a lot of different things, but for film it's, it's, it's everything. It's the script and the cinematography and mm-hmm. this. And, in music you have lyrics and drums yeah. and bass but I feel like you're driving in your car you're not going to watch a movie <laughs> if you do it's illegal. Yeah. if you do <laughs> that's a really stupid idea but I think what I find is like music you can just hear a sound come on that you've never heard before and you can just be like oh what's yeah. this mm. oh what's this it's rare to me that I'll find a film where like two minutes in I'm like oh what's this mm. like it does happen but it's rare yeah. whereas music I think it's a lot easier to just hear like two bars and you're like oh oh I'm sold what is this like what is mm. that I, I really liked when I when I was working uh, in a place where they everyone had laptops uh, I used to use a music service called uh, Pandora oh I think I remember that yeah it, it was kind of like Spotify before Spotify was yeah. really big but uh, it, you were only allowed to use it if you were in America so you had to put in like I a zip yeah. code oh okay 
No, 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 yeah, just yeah. put in a zip code of where you lived, so I put in 90210. I being, almost do that. Being the only American zip code that I know. <laughs> but, I almost uh, do that. <laughs> So I kept getting ads for, like, tire centers in Beverly Hills or, <laughs> or whatever. But that's why you put in the zip code, so they could localize yeah. the ads. Yeah, it's good. Uh, so, yeah, so I got a lot of uh, tire ads for Beverly Hills. <clears throat> but... Uh, what I really liked about that that service, and I know Spotify have something similar now. I don't have as much time to use Spotify, same Spotify, same. but um, you were able to like pick an artist or a song that you liked, and then hit start radio. Yeah, yeah. And it just created a playlist based of stuff that was similar. And I, I, I discovered so yeah. much music from yeah. that. Yeah, Spotify, I use that in Spotify now because I do um, the night shifts and work, and there's no mm. one around and just on my own. And I put in my headphones anyway, and it's just twelve hours of. Your stuff is available on Spotify, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, which is Ooh, terrible. I want to put in Evan's stuff and start a radio and see what other relative stuff comes up. I want to do that you too. I was just going to say, <laughs> have you not? No. Um, oh, that's interesting. That is very interesting. Yeah, because yeah, uh, I just found that a great way to discover music because at the time where I was working, it was usually maybe two or three people in a room and you'd pick a, uh, an artist or a song or something that all three of you liked and, yeah. just let it, and then just let it play. play. So, you, you know, there was kind of a little bit of discussion at the start to see what song to start with. Yeah. And then it all kind of came it, together from that. from that. Whereas yeah. now where I'm working, uh, it's all, the only thing they have is radio. So it's like whatever's on the radio is playing. Yeah. Uh, I don't really have the chance to do it while I'm driving. So it's usually yeah. whatever's on my phone. And uh, when I'm sitting at a computer working, usually I'm editing something, and audio is important, so you can't really have music. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a tricky one. Like as I said, my new thing is the podcast that I listen to, which I'll yeah. just give a quick plug here: Movie Crypt, uh, Adam and Joe. It's a really good podcast, and big fan, big patron of it. Um, but what I find is I can listen <clears> to <throat> that when I'm editing and doing that stuff, or even writing, because I can keep it kind of in the back of my mind. It's not I like don't music. know how you can do that. I'm incapable of doing it. It's fine if I'm doing color grade because I okay, don't have to yeah. pay any attention to the audio. I can hear whatever podcast I'm listening well, to. What I do is I, I'm really, I, I don't know, maybe it's just my mentality, but I'm able to like plug in a set of headphones to like my phone, play the podcast on that and have my headphones on. Or yeah, have my headphones on. And then legit, like if I need audio again, just plug it into the laptop, the podcast pauses and I check the audio and then plug it back. No, I can't do that. <laughs> I, I have to like, if I'm, maybe it's just because I'm so easily distracted. If, if I'm like editing and there's something playing in the background, I, I find that I'll do like a little bit and then I'm just like, that needs to stop. And then I lose like 20 minutes and I'm like, oh, I should, what are we doing? <laughs> Turn that off. Obviously, actually, oh, something I meant to ask you earlier, it's cool that this has brought me back to it because I totally lost it. <laughs> uh, you, we were talking a little bit about what it's like being on set with the Badgers and stuff, yeah. and obviously that's a very communal experience, and it's a lot of it can be hard work, but it's a lot of fun and a lot of banter and enjoyment and all that kind of stuff. But do you find that for you as as a musician, as a songwriter, that a lot of your time is spent in isolation, a lot of your time is spent just in your own head, just yeah. working? And how comfortable are you with that? Are you comfortable with your own company? Oh my 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 head is a scary place. Like, <laughs> like somebody yeah. somebody once asked me, they were like, "Can you like describe your head in three pictures?" And I was like, oh, "Okay, that's a great question." Yeah, uh, I, I, Patreon I, thing. Uh, if you want to come on and comment under this podcast, three pictures that describe. Oh, that's inside. amazing! I want to see what our patrons come back with. Yeah. That's so really cool. Mine was. Um, have you ever played Devil May Cry? Yeah. Yeah. Do you know that which one? Uh, the fourth Two. one. Oh yeah, yeah. Do you know that big demon that you fight the at the start? Thing, yeah. Of it? Yeah. Him, right? So it was kind of like that, and then it was like a patch of lovely green grass, and then it was just that again. <laughs> it was just like <laughs> that's the inside of my head, right? I like the way order was important. Yes. Because yeah. like Balrog, grass, Balrog. <laughs> yeah. So it was like fire and brimstone. <laughs> my little patch of grass that I venture out of sometimes and more fire and brimstone <laughs> that's what I imagine my head like but I, I think creatives like whether it's like lyrics and songwriting and yeah. I have to also say a massive kudos because I cannot write lyrics when I was in the band lyric writing I, I love writing I love yeah. writing stories I love writing narratives I I used to try writing songs and they were so bad. Like they were like, <laughs> Joe, when like a 13 year old writes a song and you're reading it, you're like, oh God, <laughs> man, this is so cringy. Those were my lyrics, like they're terrible. Uh -huh. So major kudos for that. Um, 
But yeah, I think creatives in general have very similar to what you just described, yeah. Battle Rock Grass, Battle Rock. Like, like, there's very little green area in there. <laughs> yeah, but like, and I, like, I know that it's kind of a down point, but I had like really, really bad depression. And my my little my patch of grass was kind of like don't worry. <laughs> yeah that's, i remember i turned like 19 and i said to my mom i was like i can't handle life and she was like oh depression runs in the family i was like and you tell me now yeah, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah well i mean they don't want to ruin your teens yeah, yeah. but uh no, your 20s <laughs> in all fairness now i actually i don't know how i did it but um through years of dealing with it i actually I, yeah, I, I got into it and I, I kind of gave it its place and it, it can come back sometimes and I just yeah, kind of sit there with it for a with and, life. but the thing is I, I've, I've battled with it so much that I can kind of, if it does come back, I can kind of put it back in its place and I'm like, it's, you know. Good, it's an interesting discussion here because it's something that people don't often talk about quite openly and it annoys me because it's not about like being like, oh, look at me, I have depression. It's, it's, it's being open and honest about your experiences, yeah. but it is so important and not, and not enough people do it. But for me, it's it's very like that where I've become accustomed to. I've gotten to a point where I can feel it starting to come. Like yeah. literally, it's it's the Phil Collins song. Oh, I can I, feel it come. Like as soon as it starts to rear its ugly head, I'm like shit, shit, shit. But now I'm prepared yeah. when it comes. Mm. I used to not be, and it would come on just in a shot, and I was like, oh no, like just break down. Yeah. It's it's funny because when when we're messaging, I can tell <laughs> when you're going through. Like, so yeah, like <laughs> I can tell even mid sentence when you swing from one side to the other. I'm bipolar, man. Not too it, It's like it's one of those things that it's like it's just because we communicate so yeah. much. Is like I can even see when you're like in typing it. I can see when you're like. Do you ever wonder what happens those times when you see me typing a message? And then, and then it, it goes, goes away, <laughs> and then it comes back. They're the worst moments, man. They're yeah. the moments when I'm in my like, I th- like, because I'm like literally writing something, and then it's not. It might not be necessarily bad. Yeah. But I'm just like, and then it just anxiety kicks in. It's like, no, yeah. I can't say that. No, yeah. Um, but it's interesting because I find that I've gotten better at dealing with it. Now it does still come on, and especially when you, when when the plate is full, like it's been mm. for the last couple of months, it's been quite hard to balance it. But I've gotten better at identifying it and better at balancing it, and my my favorite aspect of it is being able to tap into it and yeah. being able to go hey you're the dark side of me give me all those creative juices from the dark side yeah. like i want that stuff uh, i don't want to feel it but i want to use it yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but um one of the one of the things i found with it was that uh when i'd start to feel it coming on or something or something had bogged me down and what i what i learned to do was it was just like okay take a deep breath calm down Think about the fact that you can deal with this a lot better if you have a straight mind, do you know? Yeah. And then I kind of, I put it back in its place and then I go, okay, what's been bothering you? Go fix it, do you know? And it, I know sometimes it's not that easy. It's, uh, it's, it's never that easy, do you know? It's not, but I totally agree. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's what you have to do. Like for me, with depression and some anxiety, it can be very hard because your anxiety gets the better of you and you're like, the whole world is collapsing around me and it's like, yeah. Paddy, you're cu- frying an egg. Calm down. Like, the egg didn't turn out all right. Get over it. But I'm literally like, yeah. my anxiety is like, no, you don't understand. The pyramids are crumbling. <laughs> the Sphinx is falling apart. It's like, you don't realize how small your issues are. Yeah. Um, but like you say, if I just, if you just took a deep breath, stepped away from the cooker, <clears throat> looked at the egg in the pan and went, I'll just cook another one. Yeah. <laughs> you, like, that's an analogy but I have legitimate that <laughs> experience <laughs> like <laughs> Kathy drums Kathy like you're fucking making pancakes calm down this is not the Mona Lisa oh, man. Any. No, no. nothing worse than bad pancakes <laughs> exactly <laughs> once that starts to go wrong you're like I might as well just pack oh, it in <laughs> I remember my friend told me he only said it to me about two years ago right but he said to me when I was like 17 he used to call over to the house and he was like man you went like really weird for like a year and I was like what do you mean he goes you'd walk around the house with your headphones on just because you didn't want to talk to people and I was like yeah no, yeah I was like that was just like I couldn't deal with it back then mm. and for the last like two years I'm really glad to say that I've I've had no problems with it really like mm. I've, I've had kind of maybe an hour or two where I'm like I feel like shit yeah but then I read a book recently where your man yeah your your man uh your man he said it like he talks about uh bettering yourself and setting your goals properly so you don't end up like depressed because um 
you set yourself unrealistic yeah. goals, you're always going to end up depressed. Stuff, yeah. stuff like that. And then, uh, but one of the things he said was, uh, sometimes you get sad and you don't know why, but life sucks sometimes, but that's okay. That was the post I put out about a year ago. Do you remember that yeah. one? Of, it's okay to not be okay. Yeah. That got a great reaction, and it wasn't that wasn't the intention of it. It wasn't. Oh, I want to put this out to. Ta-. It was legit. Just like I was feeling like shit, and I went, you know what? It's fine. Yeah. Sometimes like guess that. what? <laughs> like feeling like shit is not a bad thing, and and it. I know it is, but it's not. Like as in, it yeah. happens to literally every human being on yeah. the planet. That's actually after Mersey Boys. Remember, I said it to you. I was like, sometimes oh, yeah. life sucks, but that's okay. And it wasn't actually. There was nothing wrong with me. It was just I really liked that saying. Oh, I was yeah. like, so when you feel like shit, sometimes <laughs> and it's like it's grand. Like I'll be fine tomorrow. <laughs> I I was saying that I want to get on the wall and here somewhere as well alongside our tagline. But it's one of my favorites, and I think you like this as well. You'll appreciate it. Um, which is I don't like dreams. I like goals. Yeah. goals are like dreams with deadlines yeah. and I was like yes that's my whole fucking life summed up in, in, in a statement one, one thing I always found was that th- something I used to put like make myself feel bad about was um, I'd set a goal and then I'd get there and I'm like why am I happy <laughs> and then it's like it's not it's not just a goal it's goals goals exactly yeah. But even on top of that, what I find a lot of is me and Jess had a great ch- chat about this in the car was <laughs> when you get to like 30 and you're like, I'm 30, man. Life's <laughs> over. <laughs> it's all over. And you're like, you're 30. <laughs> like Alan Rickman didn't get die hair till he was 42. Cop on. Like, yeah. Is it is it just a, a, like a weird humanity thing that that's... A problem because you life. you always have that. Mm. Like when you're when you're young, I remember my dad telling me when I was like seven or eight, maybe. He was like, "When you hit ten, he was like, you go to double digits and there's no going back." <laughs> I was like, "Shit, <laughs> that is." <laughs> but I, like, I had like this existential crisis of like, well, what about like when I'm ten, I'll never be younger than ten again. It's like, I'll never be, I'll always have two digits in my age. It was like, I had this like whole like... Unless what? you get to 100 when you have three digits in your age. Like, but what if I don't like the stuff that I used to like? And I had this whole like, I'm, everything changes I'm at like 10. Pokemon, like what yeah. if I like Pokemon anymore? Everything changes at 10. Then when you get older, when you get like into your teens, it's like, man, when I'm in my 20s, everything's going to be so different. And then you hit 30 and you're like... This is it. Life's over. It's like, what? What is it with the human mental state that that's like a thing? It's just mad. It, it, it happens to every, like, and especially when you're like, it's hilarious because it's it happens to majority of people who are in creative industries. Yeah. I find, like, if you're just working a nine to five and that's your whole thing, you're mm. not going to be like, oh, life's over at thirty. But when you're like, I want, like, I want to make movies or I want to write music or I want yeah. whatever, you tie it and associate it to your age as if mm. that's the reason. And yeah. it's so not. Yeah, it's because you always hear about these young, amazing filmmakers who are like the next Scorsese. It's like they could be, but Scorsese's pretty old and he's doing okay. Like. Yeah. And plus, if you if you go back and look at Scorsese, he didn't start till he was like thirty. Like you know, there you go. It's like it's so. I think yeah, there's a lot of preconditioning with the media that makes you think that you, you got to do it young and you got to know where your life's going and you got to figure everything out really quick. And I think that's maybe why there's so many mental health issues. Yeah, yeah I agree. There's a lot of those kind of those built-in instincts that we have where we we panic over things like that, like age and just you know the midlife crisis. Yeah. and it's like we're living longer and longer. So can you really say it's a midlife crisis if it, if it keeps moving? <laughs> yeah, do you know, and it's stuff like that. There's a lot of these built-in preconceptions that we have uh, about life and like even when I was. 16 I thought when I turn 18 I'm going to be a grown up and it's like I turned 18 it's like what the hell am I doing <laughs> it's legit like uh, from birth to 18 is your tutorial yeah. and then you finish the tutorial and you start the regain and you're like no wait that didn't help at all I still yeah. have no idea how this game works the tutorial had nothing to do with it I, I saw that in the yeah. uh, video yeah, yeah. the one where it went through the line, yeah. Yeah. yeah it was amazing it was really good um but that, that was actually something that annoyed me was I was like inside in school and Joe people were always complaining when will I ever use this in real life I genuinely said one day I was like why didn't they teach me taxes <laughs> yeah <laughs> that would have been really helpful I did business management in secondary school so they taught me taxes <laughs> I did accountancy nice <laughs> yeah. I, I was convinced for a certain time in my life that I was going to be an actuary Ooh. Mm. do you know what an actuary is? No. <laughs> 
I'm so glad you saw the clay is dead look in my eyes yeah. you said it. And actually is the person that like when something happens uh, like a natural disaster or a car crash, they go out and they assess the damage. Oh, okay. Okay. And it, it's tied in with like accountancy and insurance and all that sort of stuff. They get paid stupid amounts of money. Like you're talking in the eighty to hundred grand a year mark. That's programmers, though, man. Yeah, and right. I was like, I want to do that. Like, <laughs> this is, it just it sounded like it's like that can't be too complicated. And, you know, how many accidents really happen that you can go to every year? And you're still getting 80 grand a year. It's like, yeah. the logic in my brain was like, that seems like a good idea. Then I did accountancy and I was like, I hate this. Fair <laughs> it. <laughs> like, it's mad. Do you know when you're younger, you're like, oh, I want to be a cowboy, I want to be an astronaut, whatever. Since I was a child, I was like, I want to be an engineer. And then I went to college to be an engineer and I was like, oh, screw this. <laughs> Actually, there's something we haven't touched on. Uh, Outside of the music stuff, you obviously have a job and yeah. stuff. Um, and yeah. what, what, what do you do, Evan? I work for an American company called Anglo-American. Anglo-America, I'm not sure. But uh, they, they have a sister company in Ireland. <laughs> How long have you been working for them? <laughs> no, you see, I work, I work for the sister oh, okay, company okay, 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 called um, Element 6. Oh, yeah. And we make industrial diamonds. Um, and at the moment now I'm looking at going back to college to be an engineer ironically and that's how we're going to finance our next movie Evan's doing the job for us yeah. if you make <laughs> synthetic diamonds can we sell them as real ones I've thought about it so much <laughs> <laughs> that's a yes <laughs> that was formerly the beers back in the day if yeah. I remember correctly and like everyone of a certain generation if you go back 20 years everyone in Shannon worked for the beers yeah. and the amount of people when I, I've worked in a furniture shop here in Ennis there's a big South African population here in Ennis yeah. when we were doing deliveries and stuff. And when I got speaking to them, it was like, oh, well, my wife worked with De Beers and when she came over, then we moved back here. It was like, basically the South African population in this town came from De Beers yeah. being there in the 70s and 80s. We, we have a plant in South Africa. So yeah. we, have, we have another sister company over there we do a lot of work with and stuff. That uh, like um, a couple of months ago, I know a lot of people I work with went over to South Africa for a couple of weeks mm. and worked over there. And then uh, there was a couple of South Africans came up to us and stuff. And oh, that'd be awesome. How come mm. they're always sister companies? Why aren't they ever brother companies? I was going. To, I'm <laughs> going to keep my mouth shut. I'm not getting any angry messages on Patreon. <laughs> I don't know. It, yeah, that's a good answer. That's the, that's. I, yeah. I just I just like phrases. Like yeah, I love yeah. phrases, and I'm like, where did that phrase come from? It's, like, I, it's when you start to break down phrases, and you're like, what does that even mean? Mm. Uh, sure, I, I found out one the other day. Your rule of thumb. Yeah. So that phrase. That comes from um, an old law that you're only allowed to beat your wife with a stick as thick as your thumb. <laughs> what? No way. Uh, no rule of thumb. way. I thought yeah. it was like either Roman thing of like rule of thumb. As in, as in up and down. Up and down and or some kind of measurement thing, rule of thumb. <laughs> no, you're only allowed to beat your wife with a stick. Oh a stick as thick as your thumb. That's <laughs> mental. I mean, there's some of those things, as you say, that just when you start to break them down, you're like, where did this come from? Yeah, like one, so one of my favorite ones that I recently discovered is, like recently delved into was don't look a gift horse in the mouth. You said this on the Mercy Boy suit. Oh man, I love, it's like, nice. yeah, so the, the, the phrase is basically like, if a good thing is happening, like don't yeah. look a gift horse in the mouth. And what that comes from is like, back in the day, if you were given a horse, like yeah. if you were given the gift of a horse, you can tell if there's any problems with the horse. If you look in the mouth, you can tell how old it is, if there's any diseases and stuff like that. Yeah. And it's basically like, when you're given a good thing, don't question it too much. Like, yeah. you know, don't, don't... Don't look in the mouth and yeah. see all the diseases. Yeah. Just be happy you got a horse. Yeah, <laughs> if you didn't have the horse yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I was like, oh man, that's a great fucking phrase. It, that's yeah. not, this is why I think I love writing so much though, as well, because the English language is hilarious. And yeah. it's fucking hilarious. And sleep tight was another one. There's two, two that go back to that, right? One of them was uh, pirates tying up hammocks. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And sleep the other tight. was uh, in Shakespearean times, they used to um, basically their mattresses were tied to the bedposts to stretch them out. Yeah, mm. and that was sleep tight. Then you tighten your mattress onto it. And then don't let the bedbugs bite, was because they were getting savage by bedbugs. Yeah, because yeah. <laughs> you know Victorian London or wherever, or, you know Elizabethan London. Yes, yeah, she actually. Uh, uh, little known fact: she actually invented bedbugs <laughs> to put in beds. <laughs> Mm -hmm. they, they, she thought they'd be more comfortable than down feather. Turns out she was completely wrong. 
Can, um, we, get a, can we get a fact check on this? <laughs> don't, no, don't go to PolitiFact. <laughs> don't do it. Fake news. <laughs> Um, um, oh damn! I had another phrase that I wanted to talk about, but it's gone now. Dang right. it! Well, uh, do you think? I mean, actually, we should have done a top of the show, but we didn't. So we're going to do it. We're going to dive into our top picks okay. quickly. So, uh, in the last week, couple of weeks, or anything like that, has there been any music, book, film, game, any any kind of media specifically, like one thing that like has really stuck with you and resonated with you? Something you've been really into. Um, I went to see a film there the other day and I really enjoyed it. It was Happy Death Day. Oh, really? I yeah, really enjoyed it. Have you seen it? No. 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 Really, I've seen really the trailer though. No. Trailer looked cool. Yeah, that's what I said. I'd seen the trailer and next thing I went to see it. And I, I know everyone, as soon as they seen the trailer, was like Groundhog Day. Do you know? Mm. That, uh, but I was just like that. Even at the, the ending now, and I'm a real stickler for the ending a film will make me. Oh, yeah. Act 3, you got to get your Act 3 right. Yeah. And the end of this film. It was, it was slightly comical, but I was just like, that was perfect. I love that. That was great. Nice. What's interesting is I saw the trailer and it wasn't like, oh, it's grown out day. I just was like, I don't really want to see this. Mm. And that's terrible because like, I love horror and stuff. But I I just, I felt like the marketing didn't hit me. Yeah. And yeah. I felt, it's weird because I've talked to a lot of people now who I trust with yeah. film stuff. And they're like, it's great, man. You got to check it out. And I'm like, what? Sometimes marketing just doesn't get it right. Yeah, so yeah. sometimes the trailer just does not do it justice. Doesn't land it. And, and like, felt- uh, actually, I just finished editing podcasts here, and Tubbs was talking about Southpaw. And the reason I didn't go to see Southpaw was because the trailer essentially told me the entire story. And that can all, yeah. That's- and that's why I was like, I didn't bother go seeing it. But hearing Tubbs talk about it and how passionate Maybe he was, I was like, <laughs> okay, now I'm interested. We were, so, we were talking about that recently, though. Remember the trailers in the eighties? Just like where it was legitimately yeah, the Halloween one. I couldn't believe when I went back and watched the original nineteen seventy eight <laughs> Halloween trailer, and it was like a girl left alone at night. Her brother comes to kill her. I'm like, we're not even supposed to know it's her brother. Like, what are you doing? Look like, at like the start to the trailer. Like, Jesus, and then it's like she shoots him out a window. I'm like, oh my <laughs> the fuck! Like this is the whole movie. Um, and yeah, so when people complain modernly about like, oh, the f- trailer show me everything, I'm like, go back and watch the trailer from the 70s. Yeah. It is legitimately the entire film. Yeah. But um, I think trailers are more prevalent now. Like, it, you wouldn't have seen... you get five of them now yeah. as well. Yeah. You wouldn't have seen as many trailers yeah. back then, I'd say. I'm terrible for not watching a trailer, especially if it's a movie I have a feeling I'll already like, like any Marvel or anything mm. like that. I won't watch the trailer. I'll just wait and if... There's the certain ones I do that with. Like, I didn't watch... And like after the first homecoming trailer, I didn't watch anything else. Yeah, mm-hmm. I just was very like no, I I and I'm heard I've heard that I'm I should be glad I didn't because apparently there was a lot of spoilers. Yeah. Yeah, well, there wasn't. There wasn't. You have to think when like it's like you said before. There's no context. Mar- Marvel released their trailers at Comic Con and DC See, released their trailers in a boardroom. Yeah, when. The first trailer for something comes out, that's always geared to fans. Yeah. Always. Mm-hmm. The first one is geared to people who know the franchise, they know the characters. They're they going to give them... In. Yeah, they yeah. don't want to know the whole story. That's who that's always geared to. The trailers that come after that is the ones that they use for marketing to the Joe Soaps, yeah. who, who are going to see it on TV and go, oh, that look like something I might like. So the first trailer is always the one that you like, shut up. That's what Joe Soap sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> Just like is, you haven't met Joe Soap. Joe, Joe Soap's gonna be so pissed. <laughs> Sorry, Joe. <laughs> but yeah. So the the first one is the ones that I always watch, and that's always because I know that's who they're yeah. geared to. And then the later on ones are kind of more spelling out the ABCs of the story, so people can who. Mm aren't a fans of the character might go, oh, that's still something I'd watch. Even I mean, if I, it is about a Spider-Man. When I saw that first Black Panther trailer, I was like, I'm not watching any more of this, but this has me, like, uh, like, obviously this whole Ragnarok one, and I need to see it. It's eating, I'm so jealous of you. It's eating away inside of me. I need that. I need to see that film so badly. Um, but I, when I saw the Black Panther trailer, I think it was where I didn't know if it would appeal to me. Yeah. I was like, is this trailer going to hit the mark, or is it just going to be one that I'm like, yeah. And I remember seeing the trailer and be like, oh my God, I want that movie now. And it's funny because I've actually watched more of the Black Panther stuff because I'm not as familiar, familiar with, with the character. character. I'm not at all, but I literally watched that and I was just like, I legit was like, I don't want to see any more of this. Like mm-hmm. everything I've seen so far has me like 
proper like in that trailer has me just going mm. like yeah I'm afraid that if I see more I'll be like I'll start questioning and I'll be like what's that who's he what's that <laughs> and I'll start I'll end up going on Wikipedia and finding out more than I should <laughs> yeah um, but yeah so happy death day yeah I, yeah, awesome. I recommend to go see it I really really enjoyed it another like, one of the highest grossing films of the year is and another oh, horror really? film I didn't know that it's called, well based to budget ah oh, okay it's budget was so low so incredibly low doesn't really reflect it to be honest it, that's what Blum do yeah. Blumhouse films are so, I mean Blumhouse have knocked it out of the park this year yeah Get Out uh, made for 3 million gross 540 Something million worldwide mm. uh, Annabelle Creation Blum yeah. again um, well Blum in conjunction with Warner Bros because Annabelle yeah. Universe is Warner Bros but uh, massive success it massive success and now like uh, Happy Death Day I think budget might have been as little as one one, really? wow. one to three I know it's, that's kind of the Blumhouse uh, tester director yeah, yeah. budgets they're nice. not going to give you more than between one and three but it's, mm. it's what you do with it and apparently like Happy Death Day looks like they went we can take a one to three million dollar budget and make it look like 50 you know nice. yeah um, Top pick, Bez. Anything you've been playing? I had one reading? when you mentioned it earlier, and now that I'm on the spot, I don't have anything. Um, I'm trying to think. I watched something. Yes. Come, come back to me. You go. Uh, mine is is a weird. One. It's it's just something I rewatched at Halloween, um, which is uh, I watched. I'm not going to even. I remember up. what it was. <laughs> go for yours now, then, because I'll remember mine. No, no, no. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> mine was, uh, it was actually the first episode of a web series by uh, Corridor Digital, uh, who are some of my favorite creators on YouTube right now, but um, they recently did a web series with YouTube Red called Lifeline. Okay. And I have seen a trailer for that. Yeah, they watch the trailer, and then uh, yeah. the first episode is free on their, on their channel, but then uh, you either have to have a YouTube, YouTube Red, Red subscription, subscription or pay for the, the next uh, lot. But the the basic premise I thought was fucking so good. And it's one of those like they're sci-fi's. Clever guys, though. They're very clever. They're and very clever. they're very video game oriented. So to see them do something like a narrative that has that video game feel about it is really cool. But um, the basic premise is uh, Lifeline is an insurance company. Mm. And what they do is they, they implant a little device uh, in you that monitors your vitals and uh, what it can do is it can read your body language uh, up to the point where it can detect if something's going to happen to you be that your heart rate or whatever but it's programmed to send a message back in time 33 days to notify to notify the insurance company so that's that's their, their gimmick is... That's so clever. That it, it sends it back in time 33 days. So if something is about to happen, it'll the notify them. Knows. Yeah, and what they have is they have what they call agents who jump forward 33 days into the future to stop whatever they've detected. So those agents lose a month every time. And it kind of it explores this relationship between these two agents who are like, they jump ahead 33 days and then have to wait until their partner either jumps and catches up and stuff like that so it's really cool it's a really cool concept watch the first episode and yeah I've seen the trailer I haven't I I, I would love because they're as I say I say it again they are clever guys yeah. like everything I've seen them do I'm like like you're too smart for me they, <laughs> they also had a really cool short uh, I think it was like last week or the week before called Smart Watch where uh, it's like these, <laughs> it's like set in the future, and these like government agents come in and they're like, "We need you to deactivate this watch." <laughs> it's like, and it's like this old timey watch shop. And he was like, "Oh, I've never dealt with one of these before." And I was like, "Yeah, we need you to erase the memory." Uh, it was like it had like government secrets on it or whatever. And he was like, "Oh, okay." And he brings it into the back, and he like starts plugging it in. And as he plugs it in, like it comes on. He's like, "Hey, buddy." <laughs> The watch is like, I have all these government secrets. It's like, you can't let them deactivate me. It's like, you need to save me. And I was like, I love this idea. Yeah, it's pretty but, uh, clever. They're, as I said, see, the thing is, they're clever and funny as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, oh, that sounds so good. i got to check Lifeline out, actually. I need to. Yeah. I, I've only uh, seen the first episode. Can you do me a favor? When we get off podcast, we send me a link to the first episode will, just to sure. check it out. Because I forget otherwise. And I do know <laughs> I want to check it out. 
Um, art to support other artists. Yeah, um, and Corridor actually also have a Patreon, um, which now that I'm getting paid, I intend on backing. <laughs> yeah, uh, oh, there's a couple now that my pages start rolling through for next month as well. I'm like, there's a couple of patrons that patrons that I've been looking at going like, I've been eyeing you up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want those perks, yo. <laughs> uh, your topic. Uh, my topic is a weird one because it's not necessarily it's something that I've seen before. Yeah. Um, but at Halloween, obviously, put me in the spirit of watching horror films. Now, on Halloween, I watched Freddy vs. Jason. That's not the film that <laughs> like me it. and Luke watched it. And we laughed, and it was so much fun. I love that film. I it's like just, it, yeah. so, it's Ronnie Yu. It's a horror yeah. film directed by a martial arts director. It's so, f- I'm not getting Freddy vs. Jason. That was, but I ended up uh, <laughs> uh, the day after Halloween watching Wrong Turn 2, which I had not seen in years not since it came out 2007, so you're talking 10 mm. years pretty much. And I remember when I'd seen it in 2007, I'd always been like, this was good, this was a lot of mm. fun. But it didn't really hit my radar, and then because I've been following Adam and Joe, Adam Green and Joe Lynch, like I've been going back through Joe Lynch's back catalog and watching his stuff, and I'm a big fan of like a lot of his stuff. Right? But Wrong Turn 2 is to me like his best film to date, with the exception of Mayhem, his newest one, yeah. when Mayhem comes out. That's out soon. By the time this podcast is on, just go see me. It's fucking oh, it's one. Is that doing cinema release? Or? Uh, I think it's doing something. I don't know how wide theatrical release, but right. it's going VOD same time. iTunes, nice. Play Store, and all that. Mayhem is my film of the year. Whatever about that bits, Mayhem is actually my film of 2017, and that's a bit a pretty impressive feat in a year with it and fucking. Yeah, it mm-hmm. is my favorite film of the year by miles. But going back and seeing Wrong Turn Two, the scene <coughs> of of that was there like Wrong Turn 2 is so I love it it's a horror film that knows what it is it knows the premise is ridiculous it knows how to take tropes and play with them and just have fun with them and all it does these setups where it's like this is clearly your final girl character oh no she's dead like this she's not your final girl character anymore or you know it it puts you in a position where you think all it's it does a great job of leading you down a garden path of like this is how I think this is going to shape out I hadn't seen it in 10 years so it was like watching it a for fresh, the first time again yeah. and it's like oh is this where it goes again oh no shit what the hell and uh, great special effects one thing I've realised when watching it was I know how big a fan Joe Lynch is the director of six, uh, of Cinescope Cinescope <laughs> And I was just watching it going, I wonder how pissed he was that this was 416 by 9. Because <laughs> like watching uh, Mayhem and Everly and all his newer stuff and it's all Cinemascope. I'm just like, I wonder how pissed. Because uh, straight away, as it, you know, the screen, on the screen, I was like, yeah, was that? <laughs> <laughs> 16 by 9. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, but it's a great film. It's clever. They, it reminds me a lot of a film that we've done that you won't have seen yet called Intervention. But the reason it reminds me of that is the way it uses the found footage idea mixed in with conventional oh, cool. filming. Because the basic premise for Wrong Turn 2 is that these it's a reality TV show called Survive the Apocalypse and Henry Rollins is this like military I fucking general. love Henry Rollins. So good in it. He was my pick for Cable actually. He's so good in it man. Mm. And uh, somebody said earlier that he was another film that they t- talked about having Cable as the lead in. I can't remember what though. Or not Cable, uh, Henry Rollins. Uh, it was Negan in The Walking Dead. Um, Oh, nice. But yeah, I just I love Henry Rollins. He's so good in this film, mm. and but he plays this like survivalist bear grill style guy who's <laughs> yes. running this reality show. But it's a reality show, so it's all, so fake that they're like, "Oh, you're just going out here, and there's candy bears here. Don't worry about this." And, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But then they get attacked by a mutant redneck family in the middle of the forest, and it just but they use the action cam so well nice. and all that. Yeah. So it's just a great film, and it's like you can pick it up on Amazon now for like six, seven bucks on DVD or Blu-ray and it's it's just a lot of fun that's something that always used to make it or break it for me was um, I didn't mind like people switching between the static cam and the action camera you know yeah. the, the the quality of footage and the shakiness of the camera the things you notice but like that was one thing I really you can do right or you can do wrong you know like you know mm-hmm. paranormal activity I could I never I get into it I, I you, you've got a friend right here with yeah. that and I've, I've, I know that there's something. You think you talked about Jess last week? The mm-hmm. paranormal activity was one that you were a fan of. Yeah. yeah. And I get it. That's the worst part. I wish I could like paranormal activity. Yeah. But it irritated the hell out of me. I couldn't enjoy it. Like I like the premise of the film, yeah. but 
the film itself I just didn't enjoy and I can remember when it came out they were talking about people having heart attacks in the cinema I think that's and another everything. factor Marketing. the yeah. hype yeah. factor can be dangerous you see I think it, because I wouldn't be as massive a fan like of horror movies yeah. as you are so when something comes out that's super different and I'm like remember you were talking about uh, with Fiat where you were like I wish I could be scared again yeah yeah, yeah. because I don't watch as many as you and I don't you're not as decent I don't have a, ten- <laughs> a tendency to gravitate towards yeah. horror yeah. films a lot of the time when something like that comes out it's like well oh, this is going to scare the shit out of me it's like I'm on board for this yeah. and it was the same with it I yeah. was like watching the trailers I'm like this is going to scare the shit out of me I'm going to enjoy this it's but then it was it was it was just a great film. Story, yeah. 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 But um yeah, paranormal activity because like my home house used to be haunted and all that sort of jazz. There was like a, a very a connection to Yeah, you. there was like this is a little too relatable. Yeah. And that terrifies me just a little bit. <laughs> it's it's I mean, do you know what and the, the one thing I have to say about this is I've never been a fan of paranormal activity. Yeah. The first, second, third Board. I, I've only ever watched the first and yeah, I'm glad I haven't yeah. watched anything else I, I've never been a fan and it's true that it literally it's the it's it's the film that put Blum on the map like before mm. Paranormal Activity was that them as well? I didn't realise it was, it was, was Blum that was yeah it was I only filmed that on the podcast the other day and I was like holy shit and then I thought about it and literally John was just they bought that movie for 150,000 oh, and yeah. they they literally got what like 750 million oh, bucks oh it was after. crazy so like that is when you think about it the reason Blumhouse became what it is a lot of people attribute it to one and yeah. one L but Paranormal Activity predates that I think does it predate Insidious I'm pretty sure it does oh yeah, yeah. it's like 2007 yeah. and what happened was they weren't looking for or did Lionsgate buy a check or did Lionsgate share ownership of it with Blum I could swear it was what gave Blum money because <laughs> that guy got money from somewhere <laughs> to become uh, what he's become their budget was eleven thousand dollars yeah i remember that uh okay let me get the but wikipedia i would always appreciate 2007 oh yeah 2007 i thought so yeah um, it was just one of these things that when it was so hyped up like there's a lot yeah. of people saying it about it at the moment now about people saying oh that was meant to be scary and it was, like, it was blumhouse and paramount Oh, it was Paramount. Okay, I knew it was. Yeah, it basically is. What was the budget? What was the return? Uh, it grossed 193 million. Okay, not as high as I had said, but from, still from 15 million estimated budget. So made for 11 grand, sold for 150, and made yeah. made that much. Like the house that fucking built Blumhouse. Like yeah, <laughs> but it was uh, just according to this, the film earned 108 million at the U.S. box office and a further 85 million internationally. Uh, Paramount and DreamWorks acquired the US rights for $350,000 and uh, it is the most profitable film ever made based on return on investment more than Blair Witch that's impressive that's what it says here on Wikipedia it was uh, the however new Blair much Witch. you trust Wikipedia it was the new Blair Witch though yeah. like nothing yeah. had done it like the Blair Witch and as I say while, true, actually, while yeah. I was never uh, I would love the Blair Witch yeah. I was never a fan of Paranormal Activity I always appreciated that it did that like I was like like I will give you a standing ovation because you deserve everything you're getting mm, like yeah. you know but I just it just wasn't for me yeah. what were you saying about it like that people are now saying yeah, it was oh, too hyped up and yeah it was, it, it was like oh it didn't scare me at all it was practically a comedy and all this but, like most of the people I asked I was like did you see the original they were like yeah so you knew what was going to happen yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was my argument with Oregon when we were talking he was like don't spoil it for me I was like you've watched a fucking mini series like, oh, I don't remember it though <laughs> which I was like yeah and then uh, when I went back to Wrong Turn 2 I was like I literally haven't seen this in so long that I don't yeah. remember the film yeah <laughs> so it does yeah. happen <laughs> but anyway that was my topic uh, just watching Henry Rollins stamp around with uh, like Nothing face like. paint on being Bear Grylls I was like it's, this is worth <laughs> price of admission alone like uh, um, sweet uh, we move on to uh, our oh, we're gonna get to the, <laughs> yeah. our closing segment kind of we gotta do our that that section of the show that everybody loves or so we believe that, that's usually the closing segment though oh well, we do kind of closing shout outs after it but yeah yeah but like that's not a segment it's shout outs okay so uh, it's yeah, time you're for actually Eddie. leaning into camera this time instead wow. of out and Patty's like this normally it's <laughs> <laughs> not the podcast <laughs> um, it's time for everyone's favourite part of the show random, random things, things. <laughs> 
Okay, so, so usual rule, guest goes first. Okay. My random Is that rule. <laughs> Uh, apparently, I mentioned it in the second podcast. Cool. I don't Perfect. think we've ever stuck with it, but yeah. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> My random thing is Rick Sanchez. <gasps> oh, you got it! Oh, I wanted the pop find so bad. They have a whole series of Rick and Morty pops now that I, I, I'm keeping this. <laughs> <laughs> this is mine now. <laughs> oh my god, it's so good. It's so warm. <laughs> it's been in my pocket. <laughs> so, I, I, yeah. I love these. I collect these. I, I actually don't. It was just the Rick one I got. I want to get him. You can get one where he's uh, with Morty holding the two seeds. Oh, <laughs> yeah. very nice. There's, and, there's, um, there's a whole bunch they just released. Actually, they just released a, a whole new set at New York Comic Con. For season uh, three. For season three. And I'm like, I, oh, I need it so bad. Uh, so good. Look, look. Oh, do you know what Pat Fung I want from Rick and Morty? Uh, I want the agent from season three, episode one, uh, that Nathan Fillion plays. Nathan, Nathan Fillion's character. The, the alien. Oh, yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. The, my new favorite one that they, they just released, I think it's limited edition. I think it's going to be very hard to find it. They released a Snowball. Oh no, in the suits. No, with the, no, no, just, oh, with, just the with the helmet. So it's nice. just like the dog sitting down with the helmet. I was like, oh, I love it. I want the, yeah, as I say, oh, sorry. my new favorite saying, because I've been watching Rick and Morty nonstop, always, um, oh, yeah. <laughs> every night we go to bed, it goes on, but like, uh, I just, a saying that's now in my head all the time is awesome possum, which is Nathan Fillion's character in that after he's like, he gets he's, sense yeah, he's like, back. Sense he's like, awesome possum, and I'm like, that's just the best <laughs> saying ever, and just Nathan, I love Nathan Fillion doing a Rick Sanchez impression because of, oh, am I a great amazing bone creature or what? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I love uh, when they're like, we, we brought you to a safe place. It's like so wholesome, so so friendly, so shonies. <laughs> yeah, so shonies. We never left you shonies. <laughs> oh, that, it's funny because that episode, I don't think gets enough praise because it was the April Fool's thing. Yeah. It kind of got almost... It was amazing. I think what happened though is because it was like, it almost didn't feel like part of season three because it yeah, happened. Because it was so disconnected. Yeah. Um, but I... I absolutely adore that episode so much. I wouldn't be in this photo so bad. <laughs> You're kind of out of focus, but in a I don't good way. care. In a good way. I probably shouldn't have shouted. in focus. <laughs> I, didn't want, I didn't want to shout in the mic, but I did it a little. So. Oh, that's okay. Okay. Sorry, listeners. A little bit of a spike, that's all. Oh, I love it. I love it. And is it just me, or is that how you always associate C137 Rick? Oh, yeah, yeah. Is the dribble. Yeah. Because like, mm -hmm. I don't think any other Rick has the green dribble. No. Uh, but even like in, when in that episode when he was bodies, changing, you, you could you see. You could always tell it was him by the green dribble. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, do, you ever, do you ever have the theory about what's in the flask? That, that it's keeping him intelligent. Yeah, the mega, the, the mega seeds. And that's because if you notice in the first episode, when Morty drops onto the ground, the, the drip starts coming out. Yeah. Uh, then, whatever, whether or not so that's in the flask, I, I hate the theory that they're like, oh, Rick, Morty obviously becomes Rick. I'm like, no. No, no, no they're, they're not doing time travel stuff, so. Yeah. Oh, I don't think so. No. Off, but really. like, it's not time travel, so. The, the one thing I liked, though, was there was another really good theory, and I went, oh, damn. It was that Beth's mother oh, wait, is wait. Unity. God. Damn! <laughs> Thanks, Thanks <laughs> new <dude. laughs> Um I've seen that, that theory. Yeah. Is Unity. Unity. I've seen that theory. Okay. And then, obviously, Unity left. Yeah. Your one, and she went back to normal. And mm. There's nothing to suggest it. My favorite thing about Rick and Marty is that you can literally have every theory, and you can oh, yeah. literally believe any theory is right, and they're never going to tell you if it is or isn't. So the one thing that annoyed me about season three is I never got to find out what happened, to Phoenix person. That a lot of people have had a gripe with the fact that there was no Mister Poop Butthole, and even his little thing at the end of being like, "Sorry, I didn't show up in this season, guys. I was having a family." <laughs> like. No Phoenix person after that introduction in the first episode. Mm. I think there was a couple of people that were a little bit disenfranchised. That yeah, well, like I just, I just want to know what happens. Yeah. I just want to see more Phoenix. Person. But we got the return of Bill and Marty, so yeah, yeah, that was for me my highlight. That, of season was, that was great. That was a fantastic because it was crazy. As soon as the music started playing, right, I was like, I went. I, I'm not shaping you. Like I went. No. Nah. No, they they always do this kind of shit. Like yeah. they're they're fucking with me. Yeah. And, I, and you know, then it started to play that moment out, and the music started to intensify, and I was like, "Oh my god, yeah. no! 
oh my god like and I, I knew it was the case but I yeah. almost couldn't believe it until it was 100% do you know the moment that I knew it was even when he was like ah oh, sinister and evil I was like but that still might not be the same evil Morty yeah. and then it's when you see the, 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 the file floating and it's like the eye patch I was like Yes, yes. <laughs> it's really good. Um, because they don't do callbacks typically. Like they do callbacks within Rick and Morty stuff, but not outside of that. Mm. I as soon as I seen that, right, and I knew Phoenix person was alive. We should probably do a spoilers disclaimer, but I don't care. If you Too late now. Fault. Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing with your life? You haven't watched Rick and Morty yet. <laughs> yeah. But um, something active spoiler disclaimer. <laughs> <laughs> something I feel is going to happen now because you have the evil Morty, right, and. I feel like he's going to take on the Rickest Rick, but you also have Phoenix Person who's well, out Phoenix, to get Rick Phoenix now. Phoenix Person is obviously still working with the... Tammy. The Galactic. Yeah. Yeah, the Galactic Federation. We're now so. gone. <laughs> but there's I, I feel like it's, yeah. it's going to be like the third Hobbit when everyone just starts killing each other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll see. Only, only season four but, will tell. Uh, see, this uh, is like three years. By bringing... Rick Sanchez on is your random object. You literally, we an entire podcast can be done explicitly about we Rick and Morty. We can totally do uh, Rick and Morty. Cast. The Rickest podcast of all. Oh man, I want it so bad. <laughs> okay, um, I guess I will give you my random thing. I have to get up and get mine because I'm useless this week. Okay, it's going to be pretty random though, since you know. Yeah, seeing as you haven't even decided what it is yet. Exactly, I'm just looking around the room. <laughs> my random thing is a bag of Scott's clown. What are they? I love that you don't know what Scott's like. This is legit the best random thing to date because it's so fucking random. Have you ever had Scott's Yeah, God, yeah. Okay, yeah. you have Can I have one? Uh, yeah. I have one, actually, yeah, because I so, love Scott's I don't like chocolate, but I'll give it a go. This, the, you want a Scott's <laughs> Come here, boys. <laughs> oh, I you? thought you were really athletic for a second and I actually <laughs> caught it. Um, Scott's Clan are like... It was something my dad introduced me to. Yeah. And so, so. Dad, dad Is used it hard caramel or soft caramel before I bite it? <laughs> uh, Mid range. Yeah, it's kind of halfway. Okay. Think, think reason. Don't yeah, yeah, reason. Mm. reason. Um, dad introduced me to these. This it is was, so bad for bug. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm going to keep talking while you guys chew. Uh, this was something dad introduced me to. It was one of those things I've never really paid any attention to, but dad used to like have them in the car because dad is a sales rep on the road. Mm. So he would always have them for like road trip and whatever. He just like, because you could chew on them for a while. You didn't need a lot. You just kind of enjoyed the, the one that was there. Yep. So it's, it's something that I've actually started doing whenever I go on a long road trip is I'll pick up a bag of Scott's clan uh, like I don't do it like I didn't do it when we were going to Wicklow because I had Orla in the car yeah and I was like no need to keep yourself focused yeah so me yeah but me and Orla were chatting the whole way so we we were chatting the whole way but uh, if I was making that trip on my own I would have picked up a thing of Scott's Clan that's a good idea just, just kind of I do that with peanuts I know it's not the same and I mean peanuts mm. are more like but I, I do like if I'm going on a long journey I'll buy a bag of peanuts and I'll just like have them in the the little side well in my car and just like yeah. reach in and just be eaten because it does keep you conscious <laughs> but yeah it's just it's one of those things that I, I was like them. I love them yeah they're so and I was I was kind of hoping that like that you would or someone would have never had one so mm. that you, you get that experience now you get so, that evaluation yeah. so yeah so tell us what, what's it like well before I start I don't like chocolate <laughs> I don't eat chocolate but good start, good start. but it was actually nice. It's because it's toffee, Twin. baby. Mm. It's mostly mm. toffee, right? It's got kind of a coffee flavor. It does. Yeah. It's a smooth caramel smothered in rich dark chocolate. <laughs> that was so. That was <laughs> elegant <laughs> as fuck. I literally read it from the front of the back. I know, because you should just get a chocolate <laughs> coffee and stuff. <laughs> Uh, I'm gonna uh, grab my random. That's, that's thing. why. That's why I had a teleprompter for uh, my music show. <laughs> I, I can't come up with good things off the top of my head, but you give me a like, teleprompter, I'll read the fuck out of it. Did you ever watch Minute Physics? I love Minute Physics. I love your man and your man's voice because he does everything so smooth. But uh, I was watching how he does it, and he has like he does the drawing, you know, and then he has the piece of paper that he just reads over it. Mm -hmm. It's like that's class. Yeah, um, I actually bought a good teleprompter at some stage for. Um, for doing shows and stuff like that like 
we intended on setting up the green screen here and doing shows and stuff here. I like the Paddy's probably in the white and this one just brooding <laughs> in the background. But um, sorry for audio listeners, we're waiting for Paddy to root around the office to find something to have as his random object. That was my <laughs> random object. Um, yeah, so I can you make it really something? random. Hmm? I can make it really random for you. Oh well, yeah. So what we intend do you do with your hands. No, I was just gonna say go out and open the boot. We we intend on uh, doing shows and stuff here, so I yeah. do have an actual teleprompter okay. and stuff. The taffy pop. So we sticking with food as the no, main no, team. No, no. <laughs> mine is not that random because it's something that a friend got for me when we got this office, and this is my. Thing. Yeah, who gave you that, Paddy? This—it's my boyfriend. My boyfriend <laughs> treats me nice. He buys me things. <laughs> it's my sugar daddy, <laughs> sugar Barry. <laughs> uh, when we got this office, Barry was like, "I got you something." Um, he knows I'm a big Adventure Time fan. Um, I, I am a huge adventure fan. The I tattoo was a dead time. giveaway. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll post a picture in the comments. I have <laughs> the tattoo. It's pretty pretty dead giveaway, all right. Um, but on my tattoo, getting Ice King was the most horrible, horrible part of my tattoo because where it is on, on the tattoo is so fucking painful. But I I love Ice King. I love Gunther more. Uh, Gunther is the little penguin he has. So this one. Um, I was Gunther. just going to say, how can you tell which one's gone there? Because it's gone there. It's a sidekick. You just know, like, that's gone there. <laughs> He's such a dick as well. Gunther is such a dick of a character. I love yeah. him. Um, but yeah, so I was really happy. It, to me, it was a little bit like a housewarming gift. Like, as in, mm. we got a new office, and here's this cool thing. Um, <laughs> it's funny that it's the Ice King and a housewarming gift. Yeah. But what I like is it, he goes really well with your Deadpool. Mm. Uh, it's kind of like you got fire and ice a song of ice and fire Ice King versus Deadpool come in 2020 it's funny that um, the amount of random things that come from loot crates yeah because that was a thing that I got in loot crate and like that I had no interest in Adventure Time it's not something I've ever sat down to watch and I was like oh Paddy really likes that and I was like I'll give him that I'll give that I to think Paddy. that's something that's why I miss my horror blocks because mm. I'd often get stuff in them that I'd be like it wouldn't necessarily be for me, but I'd be like, oh, I know a person that loves this, or I know a person that loves yeah. Jason. <laughs> Going over to Fright Fest this year, because Mike Shawcross had been such an amazing dude for us, I brought over, I'd gotten a little three-pack of three Tiny Pops, mm. Tiny Pop finals, of Freddy, Jason, and Sam from uh, Trick Lord or Treat. Oh. And that is like Mike's favorite film and favorite character, and he's got like everything, but he didn't have the Tiny Pop. Nice. And I was like, I'm going to bring that as a gift for Mike, because I know how much that character, like his son's name is Sam. Like oh, wow, okay. he he loves that character, and I was like, and I, straight away I was like, I brought you something, <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, oh my god! I need to meet Johnny Baines to give him. I have a Jason for him because I almost Je- he loves the character Jason. So it's funny. Like part of the the thing that I love about Loot Crate is I actually love giving away some of the See? stuff. But that's what I mean. That's what I miss more than getting stuff. <laughs> yeah, like like I mean, don't get me wrong. There's a couple of things that I've gotten recently that I'm like, I am so glad that I got this. He's got blue tech on his foot. Oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be so like, difficult, Rick. There's, there's like times where I'm like, I'm so glad I got this. It's like, I love this, like the Deadpool thing. I was like, I yeah. really, really like that. And um, there's a couple of cool figurines that I got of um, uh, Spider-Man in the the black and white suit hanging upside down from a lamp oh, pole yeah, yeah. and stuff like that. It's like, oh man, I love that shit. And then there's things that I get that like, obviously like Ice King, that would be massive fandoms but not something that I'd be into and that's yeah. what I appreciate about that stuff is yeah. like it's so cool because it is a lucky dip mm. Chris has done it Chris Colson that I work with in college he would be like I, when, he, well, we, when he was getting loot crate we're all broke now don't have it but <laughs> when he was getting loot crate he was, he'd be like oh, I got this fucking like thing and you know Zelda thing and I don't like Zelda so here you go and yeah. I was like yay I fucking love Zelda <laughs> um, and then but that's what I appreciate about it is like yeah. it's for fans of stuff and not everybody is the same fans of the same stuff I like the way they they not sponsored by Loot Crate or anything by <laughs> the way please sponsor us yeah. Loot Crate but I'm not saying that I wouldn't be opposed to a sponsorship we can do this on every episode guys yeah. we have a section specifically <laughs> for this stuff literally <laughs> can, all random things we can do a rick on it Nintendo give us free stuff <laughs> also Nintendo gives free stuff yeah <laughs> but uh 
Yeah, I love the way the boxes are done. Like they oh, hire black ones over there because they do um, like a specific theme. Like yeah. they might do adventure, and then it'll be Adventure Time. It'll be Lord of the Rings. It'll be like yeah. a couple of different franchises that fall under that category. Mm. Like when uh, I got that Deadpool one, they were doing um, anti heroes. So they did like uh, Deadpool. They had like that uh, <coughs> um, uh, Carnage mug. They had uh, that reversible Daredevil and Punisher hat. Yeah, the one. You know, like they had a bunch of stuff like that that was all like. All anti heroes. Anti hero uh, stuff. And it was like, it's cool the way they can pull from different fandoms and find a common theme. Yeah. So even though like you mightn't be a fan of everything, like the Adventure Time thing wouldn't be for me. In fact, uh, I was going to give the Lord of the Rings thing to Brian as well, because I know he's a massive Lord of the yeah. Rings fan. It's like, But there was still stuff in there that That's I, I liked. Of it. And I think people get... People get like to this point where they're like, "Oh, like this was a bad haul this this month." I've heard mm. that like with with the, oh, it's a bad haul, and I'm like, "But if if you get enjoyment out of giving that stuff to people, yeah, that's yeah. awesome." That was what I used to find. That's why I miss doing the horror. I'm gonna go back to horror black because obviously, <laughs> as much as I love the, like Luke Crate would be awesome. I I'm a horror nut, and horror black for me was legit. But yet again, I know enough friends and people that are yeah. also horror nuts that like if I got something that I'm like ah, not really for me, I know enough people that would be like. Ah, that. Awesome. Um, so I don't want to start winding down too much yet because there's just one or two things I want to go through which is Evan what are you working on now what's next for you in life what's your next thing what's your next goal my next goal uh, my next goal is to f- have a full 12 song album awesome actually scratch 12 <laughs> <laughs> possibly 10 <laughs> I would go 15 it's great double album with two 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 <laughs> yeah um, Limited edition vinyl. Yeah, progressive. Yeah. Rock. Um, I'm also in the middle of building a studio, so once I get that finished, I can do a lot more work on my own, and then when I do go into Joey or whatever, so I'll probably still go back to him for the actual album recording. You're going to do your own scratch tracks yeah. and stuff. Yeah, and I can have like the song built out and whatever, so I can just go into him and be like, come on, Joe, we're doing this. Um, but yeah, the I guess actually the goal before that would be finish off the studio anyway, but my, my next music goal anyway is to finish the album. Finish, take what you will. Deadly? Yeah. Um, and then on the, the film side, not necessarily a goal, but like what's next for you? What are you doing in the film realm? Um, I'm still always up for composing anyway, and we're working together on a couple of things. Um, sound design, something I want to move into as well. And and you're quite good at it. Even the little bit you did in intervention in the score was really nice. Yeah. And uh, what I'm hoping to do as well is extend that sound design to doing uh, the 5.1 mixes. We were talking mm. about it earlier. That uh, I, I want to kind of move into where I can explain. It becomes slightly like a business that because like my dream really, as we said earlier, it's not about the money. Mm. It's about being able to do this and just support myself just being able to do what we love do you know mm-hmm. and that yeah I guess that is the dream yeah. for sure that is as I say dreams their goals are deadless, but that's the dream yeah <laughs> uh, is, is to be able to do this and not constantly be like well I guess I gotta sell everything I have to try and do something that yeah. benefits everybody else detox your pockets because I love it like um, detox your pockets detox your pockets is, is cool <laughs> um Actually, I have one question for the two of you before. Oh. Uh, band names. What was your band name? When I was in a band. Yeah. Oh, it was awful. It was called... Oh, look at you. You're <laughs> fucking scared. Okay, I got two. Three. Two. First band I was in was called... Well, the first band that I was properly in was called Unnecessary Noise, which was a terrible name. Because I, I straight away I said, you do realize the first review will be Unnecessary Noise. Yes, it is. Like, I'm like, that's yeah. it. Yeah. So we were called Verfield. <laughs> V-E-R-F-I-E-L-D. Yeah. And it's such a stupid name. Reason by the name that I'm not going into it on a podcast. Okay. I to. I, I have... Yeah, I know the name. I, I have three band names okay. that I want to talk about briefly because... Each one has its own its own meaning. Uh, the first one, first band that we ever had, was me and my friend Moses and uh, my friend Peter on drums and Valerie was singing. And uh, our band name was "She Broke My Heart, So I Broke Her Legs." <laughs> 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 I 
uh, because it was a misheard song lyric. That I, I can't. I don't know what the song was. I don't know what the actual lyric was. But I, I, whatever way I heard it, I was like, "That is genius." And I told it to Moses, and he was like, "That should be our band name." And I was like, "Okay." I've only met Moses twice, but I love him. Yeah, uh, our hit, our big hit song was "I Like Cheese." Uh, that was. It, it essentially it was just Moses playing like two notes on a bass just going like bum 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 <laughs> and Peter was just playing the drums and he just went up and he was like I like cheese and I like cheese and in the morning I like cheese and then the second verse he just changed the time of day that he likes cheese and it was that was There's our an oasis on it yeah that was our it's uh, all tense in oasis yeah that was our big hit song then uh, in college I was in a band called Grab the Mic uh, because our lead singer was Mike and um <laughs> Uh, we were just just did a lot of covers. We did a lot of different bits and pieces. We won like a battle of the bands, and we got to play like a an hour set at the King's Head in Galway. We had a regular spot in the Keys for I think it was every second Thursday uh, mm. for student night in the Keys. It was pretty cool. Uh, we did okay. We I don't want to say we made money, but you know I was between that and working in the shop, I was able to buy a new drum kit. So yeah, so that's pretty okay. And then after that, I was in a band called Which Way to Egypt. Which, uh, it was uh, all original music, uh, it was uh, me, uh, Liam, who I was talking about earlier, who was in Bobo, uh, Brian, who was also the guitarist in Bobo, uh, my friend Michelle, and my friend Damien, who had that photo of James Hetfield that I was oh, showing yeah. earlier, um, and it was the five of us, and we just kind of all got together, we all liked the same kind of music. We started writing songs, and one day we had kind of come over, I did the electronic drum kit in the apartment uh, I was in in college, so we all came over, we used to jam and play there, and uh, we had written about four songs at this stage, and we were like, we don't have a band name yet, it's like, we should really, like, we shouldn't leave the apartment until we get a band name, you'll actually, you'll really like the origin story of this, I, this you story. told me before, but I can't remember, yeah, but so we were like, Okay, we, we, we're we setting it, we're not leaving the apartment until we come up with a name. And it's like, that involved about an hour and a half of going, we should be mic stand, bin, or, you know, a keyboard, whatever we could see. Uh, so obviously that didn't go anywhere. And uh, it was coming up to Halloween, and uh, Brian, the guitarist, and uh, one of the singers was like, talking about how he wanted to go as a Pyramid Head from Silent Hill. For Halloween, that's what he wanted to dress up as. And we're like, oh, it's really cool. And But he, he was trying to describe it to Michelle, who had not seen or played Silent Hill. Yeah. And he was like, oh, it's this guy with a big uh, head for a pyramid. <laughs> and we're like, no, 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 you got that wrong. And he was like, oh, well, why, what did I say? And we were like, you said head for a pyramid. And we're like, <laughs> head for a pyramid. And we started pointing. And Damien was like, no, no, motherfucker, Egypt is that away. <laughs> <laughs> and we were like, no, it can't be because Galway Bay is there, so Egypt has to be that way. We spent about half hour organize, like arguing about which way Egypt was from the apartment we were in, <laughs> and we had to like we went. Uh, this was before we had decent internet, so luckily uh, one of the lads had a, a map printed on the wall, <laughs> so we had to go up and then figure out which direction. Turns out uh, Egypt is actually uh, southeast of Ireland, so we. I had assumed that it was southwest. I think I knew it was southeast. Yeah, yeah I, you I go down to Gibraltar and then across mm, southeast. Yeah, so uh, we were convinced it was southwest, but it was Damien was right. It, I, I I conceived Damien, you were correct. Uh, Damien number one. <laughs> uh, Egypt was southeast of Ireland, so then we had to figure out which way Galway Bay was and figure out exactly which direction Egypt was. And then, like after about an hour of arguing, we sat down. We just started laughing about it. We were like, that was really funny. <laughs> and then we were like, which way to Egypt? <laughs> and then we were able to shorten it to WW2E and whatever. And then the next debate was whether or not the question mark should be a big part of the title. And if you see, actually, I might bring it in someday. The upside down question mark? The, the question mark that's made out of arrows. Yeah. <laughs> it's on one of my guitars uh, because that yeah. became our symbol then of like, the question mark that was made out of arrows pointing different directions. <laughs> I'm going to ask another question. How are we on time? Uh, we are just just over the two hours. Okay. Quick question, so. Uh, you're doing all your own music and stuff at the moment. Yes. Would you ever be in a band again? Oh, yeah. I'm actually working on it at the moment. 
uh, pulling a band together. Um, me and the who future guitarist um, Chris Ward. Did you know him? He's from around Limerick. Um, he's going to jump on board with me anyway. <clears throat> he does his own music. I've talked to him about it and stuff. But he just was really excited. I put up a thing on Facebook saying guitarist wanted because I said I'd pull it together slowly. And I'm hoping by kind of mid next year to have it all pulled back together. And I've already got, I know... Is the intention to have that like a touring band? Like as yeah. in, you're still going to write the stuff and kind of record it and do all that kind of stuff? Or is it... It'll depend. Yeah. I'd say it'll depend and just see how, how it goes, how I get on with them and how it flows. Like, cause yeah. The the last band, it just it didn't work when John, you know, because I I was always really laid back. I'd come in with the guitar and vocals, and I'd be like, just write whatever you want, you know. And a lot of the time, that ended up with people like not really knowing their part in a weird. I only ask that because from my experiences, not necessarily in Burfield even or anything, but uh, music is often a f- <laughs> like bands and stuff are often kind of a feeding ground for ego. Yeah. Where it can be like, well, I'm the reason this is successful. I'm the reason, and I just was wondering if that's something you'd, you'd. Yeah. <laughs> there's always the fear when you're pulling it together that it will start turning into that, or I don't know. That's but that's what I'd be worried about. Like uh, a lot you of can't people. Be worried about anything. Huh? You can't be worried about anything. Yeah, no, that's true. <laughs> okay, by by worried, I mean uh, that might be an issue. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's the difference. But, yeah, I just wanted to ask that. Baz, would you ever be in another band again? Um, possibly. Um, as of right now with how busy CBM is and working full time I can't I couldn't commit to being in a band full time yeah. do you miss it? Mm-hmm. I do miss it I do and it's so funny like gathering up the drum kit for the Mersey yeah. Boy shoot and stuff at the weekend I was like oh, I want to sit down and play this now <laughs> yeah um, so I do I do genuinely miss it like I have thought about buying a new electronic drum kit that I could set up but I was again I was like I don't have the space I don't have the time Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's always a hard call. Yeah. I've the same with with bass. Even like you, you've let, lent me that bass for the last year or so, and it's like all these good. T- now sometimes when I'm sitting here, it's great to if I need a break from yeah. working on something, I just turn around the chair, pick up the bass, jam a couple of notes out, put it down. It's a great way of distracting myself or de-stressing or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think for me, uh, as much as I love playing the bass. I don't think I'd ever be in another band again. It's it's not easy like being in a band. It, yeah. it really isn't. When you when you have four creatives, and they all have a big part. I know here it works because we, we have a team. We all have our jobs and stuff. Do you I know? think that's you've hit on something really important. Actually, I know we're over time, so we'll just try and wrap this up. But like, what on a film set, like something we've really started to identify with Celtic Badger as well is people's strengths, weaknesses where they don't want to be. So like, you're like, I'm a, I am a cinematographer, and that's like. I can fucking nail it on that job. Yeah. And like Aaron's like, I'm a fucking editor. I can nail it on that job. Or where people know where they want to fit to some extent. Whereas I think sometimes in a band, ev- everyone wants to be the lead, mm. even if they don't. Mm. Even if they're not, but it can happen. Like it just. It's, it's awful because I always think, as we were talking about earlier with the bass and the drums, you know, as much as they might feel they're in the background, like it's, oh, it's honestly like, so you good. know, lads, we're nothing without each other. Mm. Mm. We are the sound collectively. We, you know, as much as someone's like general, <laughs> <laughs> we'll join up together. Yeah, as yeah someone's like drums are the green. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be the red. I want to be the red. But uh, someone's generally in the front. But like, the guy in the front is nothing without everyone behind him. Exactly. Like, that's even, the exact same as CBM. Then. Like, yeah. That's the, it's it, whatever. If a film says directed by, that doesn't mean that film was all you. Like yeah. it's every single person that comes after it. My, my, is the reason it happened. My main one is I always say it to people. I like I said it to, and it only dawned on me then. I said it to one of the lads one day. I goes, Joe was amazing. They were like, who? And I went, Michael Jackson's band. Oh yeah. And they went, he's, he's Michael Jackson's band. So good, and I was like, yeah. I was like. He had a band. It wasn't just him on stage, like. But they they had assumed it was. Yeah. They had assumed it was a backing track or something. Do you know? His his bassist was actually. I un- loved his guitarist. Uh, all of his, it, yeah. of course, he had the best band in the world. Yeah, was no. Michael Jack. Like, <laughs> you, you you know you're gonna get that. Um, yeah. So we gotta start winding down. Yeah. Um. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank Thanks, you. Man. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Oh, you're going to get to do this again. Oh, uh, again. I'll be back. Yeah. <clears throat> so this is becoming another little tradition of the podcast. Uh, we're six in now. We have, so. your, we have your silly intro. We have my silly outro. <laughs> so uh, as we say every week, and we mean it every week, and it's not 
fluff or bullshit or anything like that it's as genuine as it can possibly get we need our patrons like they make this happen if we don't see people you make it happen yeah you the patrons who are watching this like and you're watching it first because you're awesome um but we we can't do it without it without the support because technically we could technically like we there's nothing technically to stop us well if we can't pay rent on the place that's definitely yeah, a, that's a reason definitely a big problem but i guess what i mean is like we can technically come in and do this every week but we have a lot on like so we have to make a commitment to do this week on week and we do that because we value your contributions and so if you can I, I say it every week now but if you can tell one person just like dude if you've got three bucks check out Celtic Badger Media if you like what they're doing just throw them, throw them, some, throw them anything mm-hmm. like it all it takes is telling one more person to really help us out um, so we, on that note I'd like to point out some incredible patrons who have funded <coughs> us at a seven dollars or above tier um, starting with Ashling Healy Ashling Stephen McGowan Scooby Will put <laughs> Will put that, one, that one's all on you That was from the live stream <laughs> So uh, If Will doesn't like that It's Aaron's fault <laughs> uh, Kelly wrong Kelly Hashtag 11 uh, Jade Murphy Go on Evan Jade <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's Evan's sister Um Nicholas Vince. The Chatterman. <laughs> uh, Orlaith Brennan. The Bear. I misspelled Orla's name with an E, so I'm just taking it. It's <laughs> fine. Uh, Brian Fay. Daddy. <laughs> Every time. Uh, Abel Garcia Cortina. Abel. <laughs> Who's the only one? Yeah. There's a lot of names. There's three of them, man. Uh, Robert Novak. Novak! I normally go with Robbie, but for some reason I went with Novak. Oh, your good friend Clara Weiss. Clara! <laughs> Greg of the Orsies. Greg Orsi? Greg of the Orsies. Greg Orsi! <laughs> uh, Evan Murphy. Evan! <laughs> And this is my favorite one every week, Fashion Gill. My missus! <laughs> <laughs> See, look, if you get your name on this list, that can be you. Yeah, this, this guy who can't sing anything will sing your name <laughs> and in, in that exact same tone. Imagine if we got to like, if we got to like 100 Oh pages, God! <laughs> we'd just have to select ones, we couldn't name them all out. Like, no. We'd have to up the tier. I just have to be really fast, like, Ashley, Scooby, Will Pop. Yeah, you just give me, give me the list, and it's like, here, you sing those off, will you? <laughs> While you're doing the outro. Oh, but genuinely, though, like, everyone that subscribes to the Patreon, thank you. Everyone who supports our stuff through Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, thank you. But, and those people that we've just named out are high-tier supporters, and obviously everybody matters. Those people have put a little bit of more stake in, and we really, 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 really appreciate it. So much so that I'm willing to sing it at the end of every podcast. Really badly. <laughs> really, really badly. It's but it's the emotion. It's the raw emotion. Uh, Evan Murphy's uh, EP, We Take What You Will, is available on Bandcamp. It's on Spotify. It's basically everywhere you listen to music. Yeah. Yep. So wherever you listen to music. Or everywhere you buy music. Yes. Like iTunes. Bind yes. Bandcamp. Bandcamp. Uh, and support artists, support other artists. Uh, he's got a new song coming out. Yep. Poison. This December, hopefully. In December. Really you can for. follow him at Evan Murphy Official. Anywhere else that people can follow you, any Twitter, uh, handle, The Instagram. website is evanmurphyofficial.com and that has links to my Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and the Bandcamp. My favorite thing about Evan's uh, Instagram is it's at Weird Cylinder, which is one of yeah. the greatest... Uh, That's my online thing. It's handle. my PlayStation. It's so it's, uh, nice. It's so good. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram at, at PaddyBase. You can follow me at Pancaked Eamon if you want to spell it phonetically. <laughs> it's a weird one. It's demon spelled properly. Yeah, the old school English way. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's nothing to do with my typo when I was really young. <laughs> nothing. Is that what it was? Yeah. Oh, it's my really? first ever email address that I ever registered. It seems so like you intended it though. Oh no. <laughs> Dys- dyslexia hit me hard, man. It's okay. That's how I got weird cylinder. I, it was meant to be wired cylinder. <laughs> I... Same page, me, you and I. Same page. 
I'm trying to remember what the Celtic Badger Instagram handle is. We haven't really started using it that much yet, but on, on Twitter, it's at Celtic underscore Badger. And on Facebook, it's facebook.com forward slash Celtic Badger Media. Same with YouTube. Follow us, check us out. But most importantly, if you can, go to patreon.com forward slash Celtic Badger Media. Little as three bucks a month. Check out this podcast. Check out all the stills, all the exclusive footage, all the cool stuff that nobody else will get. Be part of an exclusive club of Cubs. That's all I got. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, there's got to be more to this tagline, damn it. <laughs> uh, and as always, we love you. Thanks very much. Bye bye. Thank you, peeps. Badges out. <laughs> drop mic, drop mic. No, they're expensive. <laughs>